My name is Gianluca Capzana. I was an Italian by birth and I became an American by choice. Our lives and freedoms are in danger. This is not a dream. If you're listening to this broadcast, you are the resistance. Welcome to Love, Guns and Freedom. We're not afraid. Here we go guys, this is Luca Zanna and you're listening to Love, Guns and Freedom on KTOX 1340 AM and on United States FM Network. I said many times, I never will be tired to say it again. This show, it is not for entertainment. This show, it is not for entertainment. This show, it is not for entertainment. Serious. The only reason why I took this opportunity because I would like to help myself in learning because I'm the first one I want to learn. And more important, I want to share the information that we know about the great situation, this state of emergency that this republic is under uh, attack. And the realizing that we have a serious problem, we are losing all our rights. Uh, only after we realize that, we must find solutions in how to take them back. I always believe that uh, one of the re one of the way you can fix the machine is to be part of it. You cannot fix it from outside. You must be get your hands dirty inside. Okay, and that's why I always want to encourage any one of you guys, any any person, regular guy, regular woman who wants to run for office, that is not a professional politician, and I don't care if you're running for city council or county supervisor or state assemblyman or, like, for example, like in this case, for U.S. Senate. Doesn't matter. You're trying, and that's the most important thing. When we get regular people inside these public offices, then people will really understand what is at stake here. People will understand exactly what means to have a government by the people, for the people, constrained by the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Only then we will have a chance to change back the way it was, this republic. With all the imperfections, don't get me wrong, nothing is perfect, but for sure, among all the experiments of government, these United States, and I repeat, this, not the, when the, this republic was created, was the best in 5,000 years of civilization. This is coming from a guy who was even born here, and I can tell you because I can compare this with every other form of government out of there in Europe. Now, today I have the honor and the pleasure to have with me a gentleman that I've been following a lot on Facebook. He's a guy that, uh, is guy is a man, okay? But anyway, he's a man who is not just a wannabe politician. He's a man who really understands what's at stake here, and I like his background. But I don't want to talk about him. I would like to, for himself, to introduce himself, okay? His name is uh, Mr. I would like to call him Minister Derek Grayson. Mr. Minister Derek Grayson, how are you there? I'm doing fine, I'm doing just fine, and thank you for having me on the show. Thank you. First of all, how would you like I call you? Because I don't know you, and I would like to bring all the respect I can. I'd like to call you Minister Grayson. Mr. Grayson, you tell me. I'm real easy. Derek will do just fine. Perfect. So you, I call you Derek. You can call me Luca, okay? Very good. <laughs> Excellent. Now, as I said before, the goal of this show is to try to find uh, solutions and now take this republic back, you know? And I believe that when people run for office or want to run for office, people that according to what, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're saying, your statement, you really fit that profile in according to what you say. But I would like to, for the people... To know you better, introducing yourself. Please tell uh, tell us a little bit about your background, Derek. Exactly, what do you do for a living, and uh, where you coming from, and what you're trying to do? What, what is the position you want to try to reach? Well, uh, I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, and um, mother, father, brother, sister. Thank God, still here. Um, we. I was actually born in Mobile, but my parents moved here when I was six months old. Mm -hmm. um, when I finished high school, I went into the United States Navy. I served uh, six years um, as an aircraft mechanic, aviation machinist mate. And um, upon 
exiting the military, I went to college and majored in computer science. And right now I work for MARTA, which is the Transportation Authority mm-hmm. here in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm a senior network engineer. Okay. Uh, for the, I've been there 13 years. Wow. And um, I enjoy music. I play in a band called the Access Experience. Mm. Uh, we're Jimi Hendrix tribute band. And that's pretty much um, me on the personal level uh, from um, the political point of view. Mm-hmm. My goal is to try and get people involved. But see, I don't believe that we need new leaders or better leaders. We need servant leaders because people have forgotten that we are a republic mm-hmm. where the people are the power. And we've been yielding our power to politicians that have been constantly eroding our liberties and freedoms with various policies and legislation that they enact at the federal, state, and local level. And it is our responsibility to stop that, because if we don't, there won't be anything left for our children. Hence, since I believe in leadership by example, servant leadership, Mm -hmm. you can't ask other people to do what you aren't willing to do yourself. So that's why I'm running and more importantly, I want there to be something for my 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 daughters, my grandchildren. Mm. Uh, and the way this country is going, there won't be nothing left if, I if we don't get involved. I agree, you know, um, Derek. I came here just 18 years ago. I wasn't born here. And even when things they weren't perfect at all, don't get me wrong, you know, I realized soon the things were already uh, under attack. This republic was under attack even 20 years ago, 18 years ago. But I realized immediately in just the last... Uh, few years, how things are getting so to a new level that there is not, nothing going to be left of this republic and the, the resemblance of America that your father had, with even with all problems, this is a new global tyranny that we are facing, every one of us. Now, question is, before we start, you know, what exactly, when did you have this idea you want to run for U.S. Senate? I mean, this is a big task. You need a lot of uh, funding, you know, you need a, it is not just running for local office. It's a lot of effort. When did you come up with this idea? And really, why you think you have a chance to make it? I came out with, well, I didn't come out with the idea. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a matter of necessity. Okay. I was actually involved in 2012 in the Ron Paul uh, campaign, supporting his campaign, making videos, or what I call my drive time videos, and traveling to various parts of the state and in other states on behalf of the Ron Paul campaign. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I saw behind the scenes as a delegate in my own state, that's where I first got a glimpse of the corruption Mm -hmm. uh, perpetrated by the minions of the royals of the Democratic Party. And I also came uh, came to understand that both the Democrats and the Republicans actually work together yes. when you look behind the scene at the policies that they enact. And so I decided, and so I believe that, you know, they say blank rolls downhill. Now, we need people running at all levels, mm-hmm. but I decided that if I was going to lose, I if I, if I was going to lose, I'd rather lose big. But I don't think that I'm going to lose. I think that every time I wake somebody up, I win. And running as for U.S. Senate gives me a bigger and broader audience to reach. Uh, and we need somebody at the federal level who can shine a light on the corruption and begin to actually do something that will not just better the country uh, from a federal level, Mm -hmm. but will also bring about an awakening to those who are caught up in a state of of apathy that aren't involved at all. So I want the biggest megaphone that I can put my hand on, and U.S. Senate was was what I, I felt 
and what God has led me to believe was the calling and the path I should choose. Perfect. And by the way, before we go ahead, you know, I would like to mention your website because I would like to invite every every listener. I don't care where where you are, even if you are outside the state of Georgia. If you believe that we need to send good people to Washington, okay, because Washington is already is a cesspool. It, it is completely out of control. So I don't care if this senator is from another state. We need good people to make that vote at the end of the day. We need to support in every way we care. And by the way, I would like to say, before I go with the website, I'm a little partial here. Uh, I used to be myself a Ron Paul national delegate, and uh, maybe we share most of the same philosophy, I guess. So, But that's fine. You know, I don't care. I, 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 on this show, I want everybody. I want people that I agree and people who I disagree. So I'm glad anyway that I found you there, Rick. And here the website uh, you know, Derek, you say it better than me. Your accent sounds better. Please go ahead. Say your website. So my friends, they don't, they're don't. they going to be sure they're going to get it down. Make sure your website. Okay. It's, it's Grayson2016.com. That's G-R-A-Y-S-O-N. You can also follow us on Twitter, uh, which is Grayson2K16. Mm-hmm. And we're on Facebook, uh, Grayson for Senate. Perfect, perfect. And I will post also a link on lovegunsfreedom.com on today's show directly to your website. So people who are interested to learn more about you, they can go there and take the time. Now, the next question I was going to ask you, you know, you already, I guess, answered to me. Maybe not, but I don't want to assume. Who is the person in the political world, let's say your political hero, if you want to call it like that, or a person who inspired you, who gave you inspiration the last 50 years? The person that inspired me the most uh, was not a politician. Okay. Now, there are politicians that I respect, but I am inspired by Martin Luther King, and I'll explain why. Okay. Go ahead, please. Martin Luther King is the perfect example of people doing and bringing about change from their own personal involvement and sacrifice as opposed to sitting back and hoping that somebody at the local, state, or federal level will do it. Mm -hmm. Because Jim Crow has been around since um, the 1900s, early 1900s, and it wasn't going away. But Martin Luther King showed the black community that if you get involved, and you take action like the uh, Montgomery bus co- bu- uh, the Montgomery bus boycott uh, or the Memphis sanitation strike, you can bring about change yourself, and that is what we need the people to do now if we are going to turn this republic around. We have got to get involved, and we have got to stop drinking the Kool Aid. So Martin Luther King is definitely my uh inspiration in running. Uh I do have some political heroes uh and I thank them for the service. Uh Eisenhower, mm-hmm. George Washington, uh Jefferson, Rand Paul would probably be the top of my list and of course Ron Paul is the ultimate and consummate politician because he understood what it was to be a constitutionalist. Yeah, and so one thing I would like, uh, you know, I read on your website, and also I read uh, almost in every of your statements as a signature almost, you know. You said something that in these days is almost like a joke, and not because you're making a joke, but the politicians out there, they're making a joke. You know, 100% of the Constitution, 100 of the time. I mean, the point is, our politicians already proven with facts and uh, look, for example, I'm sure you follow the situation, like uh, there was a video that I played a few times with the former Secretary of Defense, uh, Paneda, uh, when he was asked by Senator Session, you know, where does it take the authority to go to war? And they were almost incredibly, you know, astonished that the answer was, you know, we don't take it anymore from Congress, we take it from the global government, from the United Nations. So it's a fact now, we're living under a post-constitution, now, when you're going to be in office, okay, and I hope you can, uh, let's say, how are you going to start to vote 
in things that so far now they created a new America with a K. For example, the Patriot Act that was passed under the Bush administration and the National Defense Authorization Act that I'm sure you're familiar with what means and people know my listeners. What, what is your position on those two, just those two pieces of legislation? What would you do? Well, see, all right, so let me make, make something clear. One of the tricks that they use in Washington, D.C., is they add things to various pieces of legislation mm -hmm. because there's something in the legislation that they know somebody wants. So when they want to do something that's unconstitutional, they try their best to hide it, and and they present the part that they know people might like. And I'll, I'll start with the National Defense Authorization Act. Mm -hmm. That's not the do. That funds the military. Great. But when they throw in things like indefinite detention, yes. see, that's where I have the problem. Exactly. Okay. So even though we want to fund the military, our politicians, some of them who mean well, they're willing to compromise to allow the government to erode our protection. Now, indefinite detention, well, who are you talking about? They meant that it could apply to anybody in America if they're deemed a terrorist. Exactly. I have a problem exactly. with that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. A violation of our Fourth and Fifth Amendment protection. Yeah. I have a problem with that. But they said, but we need this to keep us safe. Mm -hmm. I would rather deal with terrorists every day <laughs> than lose any of my liberties, freedoms uh, in this country. You're right, and I'm glad you mentioned it's very true, because the National Defense Authorization Act has been going on forever. It is nothing wrong. It is just about funding the military. The problem when they start to uh, put, like, uh, a cancer inside and trying to attach very dangerous pieces of legislation. You know, this is sad, because uh, the same person who was criticizing Ob uh, President Bush, I'm talking about Mr. Obama, about the unconstitutional act of Bush was doing, He's been doing something that I think it's even worse, because the National Defense Authorization Act, it wasn't something just out of the blue. According to Senator Levine, he was, in, especially this part of the indefinite detention, was exactly in, uh, pushed by the administration. And this is something so serious, because, you know, I think right now, you no, know, even in countries like China or Russia, uh, this is bring us back uh, to before pre-magna carta, where now the king or the state has unlimited power, I mean, not even in China anymore, they indefinitely detain you and they hide you. They may give you a phony trial and they shoot you in the middle of the, of the, of the square. But this is so scary. And I don't care, guys, you listeners, whatever party you are, every one of us as Americans, as a free human beings, we're supposed to be terrified about this piece of legislation. Now, I didn't ask you, um, and not because it makes any difference, you know, I would f support you even if you were... A, part, a party from Mars, but what is your party affiliation? I am a member of the Republican Party. Okay, so you're... I, and, and, and I like... I, I, I put it... Uh, I made a video. No, I didn't. made a Facebook post. Mm -hmm. I walked up to a group of guys. And these are some black guys. Uh, who, who, one is a biker friend of mine. Yeah. And he introduced me to his buddies, and he said, Hey, guys... Derek is running for U.S. Senate, and he's a real good guy. Y'all ought to check him out. Mm -hmm. And one guy asked me, what what party do you belong to? <laughs> I said, the Republican Party. Yeah. And he said, well, you don't have to worry about my vote. And the other guy, another guy that was with them said, yeah, you don't have to worry about mine either. And I said, hold on, guy. Y'all don't want to at least check me out first? Yeah. Not as long as you're a Republican is what they responded with. Oh, and I gosh. said, so you're just going to vote for the D. Yeah. He said, you got that right. Oh, my gosh. Scary. We have allowed... We have allowed the two-party system to divide us amongst racial, gender, mm -hmm. and religious lines for a reason, to keep us fighting each other. Yes. Now, the, I'm, I'm in the Republican Party for two reasons, and people need to understand why. Yes. Here in Georgia, we are decidedly a red state. Mm -hmm. Decidedly. And generally... Uh, uh, Republicans are going to win our Senate seats right now. Mm -hmm. So that that's one reason. The second reason, the Republican Party and its conservative principles are responsible for the emancipation of black people in this country. 
And so I am I, I am in the Republican Party because I want to restore it to what it was. Mm -hmm. I want to clean it out. I want to clean the bastards out of the Republican Party. I want to expunge the royals yes, and restore the Republican Party back to those conservative principles. And that is why I have not left the Republican Party. I understand. And I give you credit for that. You know, I must tell you, I... I don't know. Last year, I really couldn't take it anymore. And on top, I'd been on the radio. I didn't want to have any more party affiliation, so I became independent. But I respect you because exactly what you need to do. If you want to change the machine, fix the machine, you must be inside and part of the machine. And that's what you do. I think it's great. Now, another question, because my only goal is to try to give the opportunity to the listeners to find the opportunity to support you if they think it's the right thing to do. Because at the end of the day, that's the way... How are we going to take America back? We need to get good people. I don't care which level. We got to put them in the right place. Now, question is, uh, you're a minister, I understand. Um, do you have a church? Do you, or you just uh, do this privately? How does it work? Well, uh, I'm a licensed minister, mm -hmm. and I've served in churches uh, going back to the mid-90s. Mid mm -hmm. uh, and prior to getting involved in this, Uh, campaign mm -hmm. back in 2013, mm -hmm. uh, I held church services at my home when I struck out uh, on my own. Okay, but uh, when I when 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 I decided that I was going to yield to the calling of 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 greater and and more uh, involvement politically speaking, mm -hmm. uh, I shut down services at home. Okay, but you never stop being a minister. Of the word of God. Okay. You minister in how you live your life. You minister by always being of service to other people everywhere you go. And so, uh, even though I no longer ho hold official services, mm -hmm. uh, anywhere, uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still actively involved in spreading the gospel to all those who are seeking it. Exactly. And that's what that means. I don't walk around with it on my shirt sleeve yeah. or, or trying to convert people that have no interest in, in God. But I'm always available to people when they are in uh, a spiritual need or crisis. And that's, Derek, exactly what I wanted to say to my friend. You know, this show it is not about religion. It's about personal freedoms, okay? And the difference, you know, <laughs> of uh, Christianity, even with their fault, because in the past, you know, i would even call the catholic you know i'm, I'm a former catholic uh, reformed catholic and i realized you know the church has been using power for you know using religion as a power and many people died under that power but the point is the difference christianity in the in the pure sense of the word uh, is different from other religions because at the end of the day you, we don't force you don't force your convictions on others especially with violence okay that's the bottom line And uh, at least the last, uh, let's put it in this way, the last 200 years, things have changed a lot. Because sometimes people like to try to say, you know, compare, for example, the, the Muslim religion with the Christian religion. It's completely different thing. In their books today, they still need to force on, uh, let's say, force this religion on you with force. And that's my point. But the point I was going to ask you wasn't about much about religion, about guns. If you have a church, if you had a church, Uh, would you allow your, um, you know, fellowship, you know, your, 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 the people that come to your church, would you like to have the, the right to defend themselves or would you like to have like a gun-free zone like many churches, unfortunately, they're doing or they've done, even in your part of the state? I would encourage my parishioners to wear their guns. Yeah, because uh, the situation is pretty sad. You know, you realize that when very well, The moment that we created this gun-free zone, that's where criminals love to flourish and they are attracted to. Now, I, I, I know, according to your post that I follow you on Facebook, I know your position on the Second Amendment, but I like always not to assume for anything, and more important for my listeners, I would like to give them uh, the opportunity to know you better. The right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. What is your position, for example, on the National Firearm Act of 1934 and even the creation of the ATF? Um, what would you do if you were a Senate? Would you try to uh, maybe go back to the real intent 
of the Second Amendment, or would you still support agencies like the ATF or some sort of a federal gun laws like uh, the National Defense, excuse me, the, the 1934 Gu uh, uh, Gun Firearm Act, and even the 1968 that was under the Senator Dodd? What is your position on that? My position is to re repeal any gun control laws that infringe upon the rights of the individual to own and bear firearms altogether. Right. Now, do I think that we need to have legislation uh, that would protect us from people engaged in arming criminals, known criminals, or trafficking firearms illegally to individuals for criminal enterprises? Yes, we need to have laws on the books for that. Mm -hmm. But any any legislation that impedes the ownership of guns by private individuals, law-abiding citizens, I fight those. Uh, I fight them now. And I just want to make clear to to listeners, to your listeners, about the Second Amendment. Because, see, there's a group of people out there, when they are left with no logical means to justify gun control, mm -hmm. they throw up the militia argument and essentially saying, well, if you want the right to keep and bear arms, then you should get the government to get rid of the military and form a militia again and everybody show up and, you know, to get trained, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which is utter nonsense. And what people need to understand about the second, it was understood that as an American that you you would be able to own and bear arms, period. Mm -hmm. Whether that was a militia or not, that was just understood. It was never in question. The Second Amendment sought to add another layer of understanding, and that is the ability to fight tyranny. Because as a citizen, you got to have a gun to for self-defense. That was understood. You had a gun to be able to protect your property. That was understood. And you had a gun to be able to hunt, to put food on the table. But now they wanted to ensure mm -hmm. that you had a gun. If it came down to it, an armed citizenry, the militia, could defend against tyranny. So just because we have a standing military, and if you read the Constitution and look deeply into it, where it was never intended to be, but because we do, it did not negate the, the, the it did not negate the ability for the individual to still maintain or, or own maintain and bear arms. And so you, you got to be able to articulate that to individuals so they understand why it doesn't matter if we have a standing military. Exactly. It doesn't matter if if I don't go out and hunt food. It is simply understood that I have a right to own and bear arms. Exactly. It says the right of the people. It doesn't say the right of the state. And it's not a privilege. It's a right to keep and bear arms. Exactly. And more important, you know, you say something very important. It is not about hunting. It is not about even self-defense. It is about, uh, as the last line of defense, or with the people, to stop an eventual <coughs> foreign or domestic uh, act of tyranny. That's the bottom line. So we, the people, as a collective, but also as individuals, we have the right to be the last line of defense against evil and tyranny. Now, talking about guns a little bit, you know, because I'm fascinated, I learned... Uh, when I came to America, a little bit of history of this country, and also understand, the, at least I try to understand what's going on. The first real gun laws and registrations exactly happened as a racial uh, act of racism against people of color, because they were afraid that, uh, you know, the black people, they would be have that right, as uh, the white people, to be armed. So... According to what I read in history, and correct me if I'm wrong, you know, I've been studying different things. I don't want to go now in details, but this is pretty much during, after the Civil War, the first legislations to limit and uh, give some sort of a gun restrictions with licenses were created to try to stop black people to have guns. That's the bottom line. And after that, we all became potential slaves because now, you know, first of all, I find it very racist when I go to fill up 
an FFL application that they still treat us like by color, white, black, brown, Indian. I mean, we should be American spirit, but that's you know another story. But the point is, is it true, according to your experience as a black man and also studying history, that the first real gun legislations were to limit the right of black people to have their right of the Second Amendment? Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, North Carolina... Mm-hmm. Uh, was one of the first states uh, in 18, uh, sorry, yeah, 1834 or 1843. Yes. Sometimes I get the numbers twisted. Mm-hmm. But they basically said any Negro, person of color, mulatto, et cetera, et cetera, if they have a musket, a rifle, a dagger, mm-hmm. any type of weapon whatsoever, they had to go and obtain a license in order to have it. And the, what people don't understand, when the KKK was formed by the Democratic Party, mm-hmm. they wanted to make sure that they could carry out their night rides without the people being able to resist the tyranny. Uh, remember that, that amendment called the Second Amendment? So they started passing these black laws. They called them the black codes. Wow. And part of that was gun control. So if they could dis and, and you know, I tell white Americans all the time, if they could disarm the Negroes successfully, mm-hmm. what do you think will happen when they disarm all of America exactly. successfully? Exactly, exactly. That's why it's so important, you know, for all the people on the other side, even I really I have no side. My only side is the truth and the Constitution. But let's say for people that like to call themselves liberals, and I already told you, you are not liberals. You are fascist. You are liberal fascist. Because if you're really true liberals, if you were true liberals, means in liberty, you respecting each other, you would understand that we have rights until we don't infringe on other people's rights. But for people that they're against, uh, you know, this, have this phobia about guns, and they think that without guns we're going to be safe, don't you understand what happened in history and what's going to happen now in the near future if we have all this right denied? I mean, look what happened exactly the most racist thing. You know, learning for me, I mean, I come from Italy and I come from a different background, but I realized very well one thing, the first thing I learned, you know, when I was studying about the oppression of the black people, they were disarmed. They didn't have the right to fight back. And that's why it's so important. I think it's so, uh, if you want to believe in equality, every human being should have their right, no matter the color. And that's why now we understand that it's happening to all of us it happens before with the Native American, you know, they were put in the camps. It happens, of course, with the Japanese descendant during World War II. No due process. A Democrat president slum, uh, ruined their life just because they were Japanese descendant or German descendant or Italian descendant. They put in the camps. And, of course, no guns allowed. And the black people have the same fate. Now, guess what? We're all going to be the same. We're all going to be facing the same slavery. So it's so important for all of you guys that would disagree on the Second Amendment, please have an open mind. I'm not here to try to antagonize you. I'm not even trying to convince you. But just open. Maybe we can have a discussion. This is about freedom. Seriously. It's not about ducks, hunting, or stuff like that. Okay? Anyway, listen. Speaking about guns, you know, because I like you very much, and there is so much people can find out also on your website. But after all, this show, it's about guns. Uh, any specific... Uh, uh, what is the rifle of choice you would like to train? And in case uh, you still have, by the way, as a former veteran, you know very well, your uh, your oath of exp- doesn't have any type of expiration. You know, you still always uh, have the oath to defend this republic. Uh, so what is the rifle that in case of need, in case of a foreign domestic uh, uh, type of tyranny, would you have to defend this republic? What is your favorite rifle? AR-15. Okay. Not one, two. So you have an R15 and any specific pistol you like to train with handgun? 45. 45. Perfect. Okay, very good. And like that. Now, one other thing I was going to ask you, you know, because uh, normally I I don't have much uh, opportunity to interact with people uh, that have a different color. You know, I live here and uh, I live in my little world and in Arizona where I live, I don't have many black friends, I must be honest. And when I find somebody that uh, I can talk to, I really enjoy it. You know, it's for me it's a good experience. First of all, I always fascinated, and I, if I, I try to put myself, you know, if I was a black man born in America, I would call myself a black American because I wasn't really born in Africa. 
And I see many people on TV, they like to call themselves African-American. But that's their choice. You know, that's right. They can call themselves whatever they want. How would you call yourself? How do you call yourself? Besides that you are an if, American. If, 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 if I've said it one time on stage mm -hmm. and in debates, I've said it a hundred. I am an American. Perfect. I happen to be black. Good. I've never been to Africa, and Africa <laughs> is a continent anyway. So it's a mis it's a misapplied term. Africa is not a country. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, African American, from my understanding, was a phrase coined by Jesse Jackson to mimic people who actually were dual citizens, like Jap Japan country. Japanese Americans, Mexico mm -hmm. a country, Mexican Americans. You understand what I'm saying? So, oh, yeah. China country, Chinese Americans. So Jesse decided we'll go with African American, and that's how we got that stupid term. Good. But uh, I've been to Africa. I, I am an American citizen, and I happen to be black, and I leave it at that. I feel I don't use. It. I feel exactly like you, Derek, because sometimes people try to call me, like for example, "Are oh, you Italian American?" First of all, not because I. When I became an American, I took an oath. I also renounced my Italian citizenship, and uh, I don't call myself an Italian-American or an Italian. I call myself an American with an accent, if you want to. And sometimes I laugh, you know, when I have people like, for example, that they don't like what I say or disagree with me, especially on the left, I must be honest. The first things come out of their mouth, you know, these compassionate people that they like to bring here illegals and give them free pass. Me that I am a naturalized America, the first thing they tell me, go back to Italy. And I always tell him, too bad. I can't. I burned my Italian passport. So right now you're stuck with me. So I agree with you. We are Americans. We may have different accents. We may have different, you know, skin color. But at the end of the day, that's the way they're going to separate us. We are Americans first and only, in my opinion. And I really consider you as a brother. You know, I, I never met you, but I follow your work. I follow your effort. And uh, I think, you know, sometimes uh, we are right now in this history, historical moment in this republic that uh, we're going to find each other, even if we don't meet in person. But I think we are all trying to work towards the same goal. At least uh, we try our best and we are united in the spirit of, 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 of this struggle. And uh, it's almost like a sort of a bond between us, even if we are not related by family. I really feel that. And I'm glad I met you even through this interview. Now, question, you know, probably is a, I don't know, I don't want to say anything that, uh, I don't want to assume. What do you think about uh, the racism under the Obama? Did we improve having this uh, semi-black, he's not even black, sorry guys, I wish he was black, but it's, it's, it's an Arab, okay? But anyway, having this new president that as a, supposedly is a black guy, did we improve this uh, relationship between races or we got worse? I know it sounds like a stupid question, but I, I wanted to ask you. Race relations, of course, has gotten worse uh, between the races. So, but that was all by design and intent, mm -hmm. driven by corporate back media. Uh, we are now seeing a bigger war between police and Americans. Mm -hmm. So, we we basically have wars on four fronts. Yeah. In this country, we have the war uh, uh, between the classes, the rich, the poor and the middle, uh, the rich, the poor and the middle class. Yeah, it's true. It's true. We have a war between the races, I'm, the races, I'm sorry, uh, primarily between blacks and whites. Mm -hmm. We have uh, the, the war of the world. OK, we're constantly meddling. Over in the Middle East, and I, I don't think it'll be much longer before we'll have boots on the ground um, in Syria. And we have the war on drugs, which is essentially a war on liberties and freedoms. And the people who are find themselves mostly on the losing end mm -hmm. are poor, poor whites and blacks. Exactly. So, you mentioned something so important, you know, the war on drugs. And by the way... Uh, people already know, but sometimes I want to be sure. I don't even take aspirins, you know. I don't even smoke uh, uh, cigars. or You know, I smoke cigars, honestly, but I don't smoke cigarettes. And the point is, I don't use drugs, okay? But I really believe that uh, the big question, it is not the drugs. The big question is, who owns our body, us or the government? Because if now the government can decide that uh, if I own a little plant called marijuana, 
and I smoke it in the privacy and safety of my house. Like, for example, right now I'm having a beer, okay, and nobody is, is in danger. I'm safe and there is no cars involved, so I can drink a beer. But because the government now says so, I can drink a beer, a hundred years ago or so, the government said that beer be made me become a criminal. Now they say that this plant called marijuana makes me become a criminal. So the bottom line is, wants the body, us or the government. And when we give the power to the government to decide what we can eat, drink or smoke, we are slaves. I'm sorry, guys. For all the people who believe in prohibition, I mean, you, you believe in slavery. Seriously. What do you think about that? Am I too extreme or am I something right here? You're not extreme at, at all. What people don't understand, the, if government can't profit, okay, put it this way. We have a problem in this country with taxation, mm -hmm. and the government learned a valuable lesson uh, under Bush Sr. when he made the statement, read my lips, yeah. no new taxes. Uh -huh. And when he raised taxes, he lost summarily the next election to Bill Clinton. So the government has said to itself, we cannot just directly tax the people. We have to find new ways mm -hmm. to tax the American people. And that's what the government does. And the government has long since said, if we can't profit from it, you can't have it. The reason the hemp or marijuana plant is illegal is because it co competed with the pulpwood industry in America. Mm -hmm. It competed with the big farmer. Uh, in America. And so they lobbied to have marijuana made illegal. Mm -hmm. And the people, when it came to alcohol, the people got tired of prohibition and demanded the repeal of it. And when it was repealed, what did the government do? They decided we're going to put in enough controls and restrictions to, to where we can get rich off of it. Now, I don't have a problem with the laws against drunk driving. Of course not. I mean, but, that's everything. I don't care if you're drunk or drugs or even just impaired. You know, we respect other people's rights and life. But in my own house, your home, privacy and safety, if I'm allowed to have a bottle of wine, you know, responsibly, because at the end of the day, if I'm sick, I'm supposed to pay for my bills, not the community. But at the same way, yeah. I should be able to smoke even rat poison if I want. Forget about, uh, you know, uh, a plant. I mean, that's the bottom line. It is my body, after all. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm glad because this is very important. Unfortunately, most in the Republican Party, that's where people really uh, shut down. And they have like some sort of, I don't know, brainwashing there. But I'm glad you bring in at least this issue and using your logic to hopefully wake up other fellow Republicans there and make understand this concept. Now, speaking about taxation, something very important, that probably for me, it is the heart of this monster, of this cancer. The Federal Reserve, or private Federal Reserve, it is not even federal. Uh, what is your position to try to take back control of our currency and to take back control of also our taxation system? What is your solution? How do you see the Reserve? How do you consider the Federal Reserve? Derek, what is your solution? Go ahead with the answer, please. What is your position on the Federal Reserve and how would you solve this problem with the you know, taxation system that we have in the IRS? I think I lost them. Let me call him back. Uh, absolutely. We're here I, on the I, air uh, I with Lucas Zanna and you're uh, listening to Love Gets and Freedom. And uh, Mr. Derek, yes, no, Grayson, I just a little too, overview. but I lost him. Uh, first, I want to take work. him back Federal to uh, slavery, the north and the south. We also had no taxation. We, the government was funded through tariffs. Now, the the report made the bulk of their money from an industrial point of view, factories and things of the nature, where the South, uh, tobacco, cotton, and things of that nature. The difference, however, where the North utilized very cheap uh, labor, because they didn't pay people anything, mm -hmm. the South had free labor. Yeah. And we were about to engage in expanding westward. And, of course, we had the abolitionists in the North, and... Uh, Lincoln was kind of partial to the abolitionists. They didn't, they wanted slavery gone. Lincoln didn't want slavery to expand westward. That is the crux of the, the, the difference between the North and the South. And the South basically said, uh, if we allow them to stop expansion 
westward, eventually they will get rid of slavery altogether. Why was this important to the South? Because this, the backbone of the South's prosperity was free labor, not cheap labor, free labor. Mm -hmm. And so this is what prompted the South to succeed, because even though Lincoln was not threatening to shut down slavery, they felt it was a violation of states' rights. They wanted to have slavery, and if they wanted to expand slavery further westward as the country moved further westward, they wanted to be able to be, do so. So, and, and now, fast forward, Civil War is over with. There is no more free labor, free labor in the South, no more slave labor, period. Mm hmm all right, and that means that people now have to pay for production. Fast forward a little more, we move into uh, a, a situation where the country is starting to struggle. So in 1910, shortly after Reconstruction, banks started to fail up in New York. And the bankers came to the realization, hey, wait a minute. If we fail, we lose everything. And I'm talking about bankers such as J.P. Morgan and the Rothschilds, etc. We lose everything. How do we fix this? How? Because, remember, everybody now pays for the production of their products, whatever it is. How are we going to fix this? So they had a meeting on Jekyll Island in 1913. And this is where they crafted the beginning of a new slavery system. They gave us the Federal Reserve Act, which was the central bank. They gave us the IRS, the ability to levy taxes against the American people. And they gave us the uh, amendment, which made that, that legal, which made what the IRS does legal. This was the beginning of the new slavery system. The central bank loans money to the Fed that the Fed prints, gives to the government for redistribution. They get the profit from it. We get the debt. And now we're, we have so much debt. All we're doing is just paying the interest on it. And that interest that we pay pay goes to the bankers. That's the new slavery system. So exactly. I wanted to kind of give that little That's... overview of of why it's such a bad system. Yes. And the example that I give people to explain that to them, you got Bernie Sanders talking about free college for everyone. Mm -hmm. But here's how it works. If you have no money in the bank, and if you want to add a new government program, mm -hmm. well, how do you pay for it? You go to the Fed. You get them to print up more money to pay for it, and then you dole it out. So if the debt is $1 trillion and the free college education for everybody in America is going to cost a half a trillion dollars, <laughs> our debt goes up by half a trillion dollars. So it's no longer $1 trillion, it's $1.5 trillion. And that's the, the mathematical aspect of it that the American people don't understand. And who's on the hook for it? Our children and their children because there's no stopping it. My solution to this out-of-control spending is the fair tax, because the fair tax would put the brakes on the federal government and their ability to continue just simply to raise the debt ceiling. And if people remember, I think it was the debt ceiling of 2012, where the government was going to shut down, because it became such a big spectacle, and Americans were starting to become aware of our spending problem, they decided to get rid of the provision or, or the, 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 the policy where they have to go and get an approval to raise the debt ceiling. Now, they just raised the debt ceiling, which is exactly what they did with the debt ceiling increase of 2015. So that's where we are. So if we want to put the brakes on the government, we need to pass and implement the fair tax that will get rid of the IRS, it will close their doors that will get rid of the 16th Amendment so the government will no longer be able to tax us directly. We'll be implementing a consumption tax. 
Mm. It'll create jobs. It'll do a whole lot of other things that I won't get into right now. Yes. But we stop by limiting the government's ability to continue to increase spending and raising the debt on us. Because eventually, if we don't, this economy is going to collapse. Period. Yeah. Derek, exactly. You know, and this is great. Don't get me wrong. I think you got a great solution there. But at the end of the day, we still have a cancer. I mean, we, before 1913, whenever time the government wanted to print a dollar, was at least still the authority and the sovereignty of the government to print a dollar. Now we give that special power to these uh, cartel of bankers, private bankers, that now magically they can print currency and they charge us the interest. And then exactly how we pay it back. You think in our lifetime we're going to be able to remove that mass of marble of building that so cocky and arrogantly is there sitting as they call the Federal Reserve? Are we going to be able to abolish it? What do you think? Is that also one of your goals, to try to abolish this cancer? Yes, that is my ultimate goal is to get rid of the central bank in this country. But we will not get rid of the central bank Mm -hmm. If we cannot uh, put under control the mechanism that feeds the central bank or gives the central bank a need, and that is government spending. Perfect. So we put the we we get the government out of the taxpayers' pocket mm -hmm. with a fair tax. Okay, very we good. Limit what the, yes, we limit uh, the government's ability to just willy nilly spend on new programs because now everybody has a dog in the fight with a consumption tax. Mm -hmm. And if the government raised it by a penny, everybody would see it, and everybody would be more inclined to tell their representatives no to this particular program or that particular program. And then we start to work on balancing the budget. And when we balance the budget, meaning the government can't spend whatever is being brought in, they can't spend above that, there will be no need for the Federal Reserve the central bank to be in place to print good gobs of money because the government won't be able to spend more than the budget, then we start to cut the budget to reduce the size of government, like getting rid of the Department of Education, the Department of Energy, et cetera, et cetera. The Federal Reserve, we can we shut down central bank, we shut down, we get rid of it. We send them home package. Very that good. Is my plan. Very good. Listen, now we're almost at the end. This hour went so fast, you know, seriously. I'm glad, you know, because all my goal is to give you the opportunity to introduce yourself and uh, people out there, they say, what can I do? What can I do? Guess what? We got to start to look at regular people like Gray uh, and uh, uh, Grayson, excuse me, and, and, and try to see at this point, you can donate $20. Everybody can donate $10. Everybody can at least do that. Because we need to send every man or woman to Washington to understand these basic concepts. This is the real, the core of the, of the problem that we have. Now, before I go, I want to give you like uh, 60 seconds. Let's say you are in a room with Mr. Obama. And sorry, I'm not going to call him president. This is my personal opinion. I'm not talking for you, of course. Mr. Obama, are you a man to man, politely, you know, but still, you know, as an American, you can tell him whatever you want. Remember, we are still under on the radio, FCC. You have now the chance to talk to Mr. Obama for 60 seconds, from man to man. Go ahead. Mr. Obama, I want you to know from one man to another that you, just like George Bush, for personal enrichment, you have sold this country down the river, and you knew better. I don't know who exactly are your handlers, but I know that they are the bankers that are behind the central bank. And I am going to do any and everything in my power to stop what you have done, what you have put in place, and to help Americans to see the corruption that you have allowed to run rampant under your watch. Perfect. And uh, this was Mr. Derek Grayson running for U.S. Senate for the state of Georgia. And I would like to say one more time, you know, this is so important. That's why I'm doing this show. I'm not here to just try to make you laugh for fun, okay? This is about finding solutions. Go to www.grayson2016.com, okay? And I will post this link on my website, lovegansfreedom.com. Everybody can donate if you believe that what this man is trying to do is right. Uh, you can help, even if you're from another state. I don't care. 
Meanwhile, I want to say this show is supported by people like you. It is not supported by corporate. Yes, we accept sponsors, but to preserve that freedom that we want to have on the show, I want to your support. Go to my website, www.zannaart.com. And you see what I do for a living. I write songs and I do other things like that. So even just downloading any of my songs for 99 cents, you will keep the show free and independent. Now, don't go away. You're listening to Love, Guns, and Freedom with Lucas Zanna. And we're going to go for our number two. We'll talk about guns and much more. songs on one CD from the heart of a patriot. For download or to order the CD, go to www.lovegunsfreedom.com. That's www.lovegunsfreedom.com. Lyrics for your mind, music for your heart. Gianluca Zana's new CD, Love, Guns, and Freedom. You're listening to Love, Guns, and Freedom with Lucas Zana on United States. Here we go, guys. You're listening to Love, Guns, and Freedom with Lucas Zana on KTOX 1340 AM and on United States the FM Network. This is the hour about guns. You know, the gun part, it is not just a technical or tactical issue. It's also about a right issue. And uh, the purpose of the show it is not just to share ideas or to put you in the right state of mind to get curious, to get some extra training that we all need. But also to understand really that our right, it is under attack every day and to find solutions. You know, I'm just a little voice here, but I'll do everything I can to help out to find solutions or to stop act of evil against gun owners and people in general. Now, I have a friend that I met a few years ago, and uh, I'm really proud of him because he was the man that in Moave County, we Moave County, wanted to try to at least bring the opportunity for us, we the slaves, because after all, we are treated like slaves, to have a constitutional sheriff. And this guy, he, he, you know, he, he tried to run as a, as a sheriff against, at the time, ter- sheriff uh, Tom Sheen. But regardless, today, you know, 
and then he'll tell us a little more about exactly what happened. But the point why, today, why he's here, because he has to share with us a very horrible story, and I invite everybody of you to verify, and I will give you the opportunity to verify, because I don't ever want you to listen to whatever I'm saying or whatever my guest is saying and believe everything. I just want that I bring you facts, and I hope you can verify when you verify if this information is true, you as a person, as a gun owner, as a lawful person who really respect other people's rights, I hope you can do your part. And I'll tell you exactly what you can do at the end of this interview. I have right now with me from Flagstaff, a town that sometimes I really even tremble just saying the names. I really, as much as it's beautiful, the politicians there really suck. But anyway, I have here with me my good friend Mike Hayes from Flagstaff. Mike, are you there? Hi, Luca. I'm right here. Very good, Mike. First of all, before uh, you know, we go straight to the nightmare story, I would like you to introduce yourself. You have a great background as a person uh, serving the community, uh, not just as a civilian, also as a soldier. Give us a little bit about your background, and then we go straight quickly to the story. Thank you, Luca. You're very generous with your compliments. Um, I'm a retired law enforcement officer. My name is Mike Hayes. Um, I recently retired from the Department of Corrections about two years ago. I went out on full disability because uh, I have spinal issues, and uh, I didn't discover those until uh, the year I was actually considering running for sheriff in Mojave County. And I was having nerve issues and back pain, and as the campaign progressed and got difficult, uh, I had more and more difficulty I ended up going to a neurologist, and they diagnosed uh, degenerative spinal disease and uh, advanced um, osteoarthritis. So I am handicapped today. I'm 100% disabled. Wow. Right there's my tag. <laughs> <laughs> okay, people can see it. We're on the radio, but I see it. It's true. He has the tag. And it's sad. You know, last time I saw you a few years ago, you were still walking normally, and uh, this can happen to any one of us. That's why I say, guys, you know, let's treasure health when we have it, because, you know, we cannot appreciate health unless we, we lose it. Please go ahead, Mike. Yeah, and, uh, you know, it kind of slowed me down. I'm in my mid-50s, and my, my back uh, medically is about that of an 80-year-old. So I, wow. I have ongoing issues. But regardless of that, at, at, at the time I was running for sheriff of Mojave County, I wanted to make some positive changes and give a lot of the residents an opportunity to, to actually choose their sheriff because I understood that the sitting sheriff out there had uh, just run unopposed for decades. And uh, for various political reasons, it just didn't work out. But, you know, I, I moved on and I tried to uh, attend to my own matters. And uh, I ended up receiving some very difficult legal problems from the Tom Sheehan administration that wanted to punish me for running against him at the time. And uh, I guess they weren't interested in the fact that I was disabled. They, they really continued to, to persecute me. And uh, it set me back a little bit. But, you know, that was several years ago since then. And uh, I have settled into retirement. I'm no longer uh, running for public office. I have no desire to do so. Uh, in fact, you're the first interview that I've given publicly, Lucas, since wow. this whole thing. Thank you. I appreciate it. By the way, one thing I remember, you also serve as a uh, part of the military, correct? Well, I was a police officer before I worked for the Department of Corrections. Okay. And then I was a corpsman in the United States Navy. And okay. I was so you, you, you didn't just do, you know, uh, you, you, you go way back in time. And this is why I want to bring it up. You know, think about it. A person like yourself, a law-abiding person that uh, you had to, you know, you serve your country, you serve the community. And now we go straight to the point how things can out of the blue go out of control just because you go put your feet, step your feet in, in the wrong stores in Flagstaff as a gun owner. And uh, things can get really nasty, very ugly, especially when there is no even, you know, I tell you, for what you told me, it is almost insane. And you're lucky that you're alive right now. But let me exactly let you talk to the listeners. Tell about your story. What happened and when happened and where? Sure. Um, I went to uh, a place called Hagen Groceries in Flagstaff. And this is their logo, by the way. Um, I'm holding it up for the camera. Yeah, we are on radio, but let me spell it. Hagen, it's uh, H A, excuse me, H A G G E N in Flagstaff. Okay. So, what is like a specialty uh, grocery store? Looks like a nice little store there, right? 
Well, they were uh, a store that came out of, uh, I believe, Oregon, and they bought out a lot of Albertson stores. They okay. only had an Albertson store at that location uh, on uh, Route 66 for years. My wife and I shopped there. It's at 1416 East Route 66. Okay. Higgins comes in, and they bought out the store. And uh, I guess they're having problems because they filed for bankruptcy now, and they're leaving Flagstaff. Wow. But when I was there on the 21st the other day, mm-hmm. uh, I approached the store at the front, and uh, I was carrying my 1911-45. It's uh, semi-automatic that I carry on my right side in a leather holster. And I'm a former law enforcement officer, so I usually carry concealed, and I do have a concealed weapons permit that is uh, – that is valid. And it was a very hot day, so I just didn't wear a jacket. And uh, I went into the store, as I had many times when it was Albertsons. And uh, I was in there for 45 minutes. Mm-hmm. Where I had surveyed the entrance, and there was no signs up saying uh, no weapons are allowed. I, I always make certain that I'm in compliance. I, I, it, it's not worth an argument. Yeah, exactly. It, yeah, you're right. Go ahead, please. Yeah, if you go into a store and you, you see signs, it's just not worth the argument. You go back to your vehicle and you place your, your weapon in the car, and, and that can be dangerous, too, because if somebody sees you doing that, they I, can... I, I just change... I just... You know what I do normally in my philosophy? I get... Uh, normally, I don't carry cash, but I have always $100 just for these situations, and I open... I knock at the window, and I open the bill, $100, and I say, bye-bye, and I also point at the sign. That's normally what I do. But, you know, you do whatever you think is right, but the most important thing, you are in there confrontational. You are a grown-up man. You're a person who served this country. You, you, are, you are part of the law enforcement, peace officers community, so you know the laws. And more important, you know, you got back pain, okay? You don't want problems. You want to just there shop your food and get out. So what happened exactly? You were there, and what did happen? Well, I walked, walked up to and it was the first time I had ever been there, as it said, Hagen's, but I've been there many times mm-hmm. uh, when it was Albertson's, and, and they did not have issues. They didn't have signs, and this new store didn't have signs up either. So I went in, and I was shopping around for about 45 minutes, and uh, while I was there, a uniformed security guard came up to me uh, towards the end of that 45-minute period, and he says, uh, the manager wanted you to leave the store with your weapon. And I said, excuse me? And uh, he said that the manager was uh, over there and saw my weapon and wanted me to take it out of the store. And I Mm -hmm. asked him why. And he says, well, they're very serious about that. Um, And I said, may I speak with them? And he said, absolutely. So he introduced me to the manager. And uh, I walked on over, and she said she was the manager. And I asked her if there was a problem. And she said, yes, you need to get that gun out of my store. And I asked her why. Wow. because we don't like guns. And I just, that was an odd expression. It wasn't, it's against our company policy. Mm-hmm. It wasn't, uh, we prohibit guns. It was, we don't like guns. And I asked her who we was. And uh, I told her that when I entered the store, I checked the front signage, and there was no signs that prohibit weapons. Mm-hmm. And I asked her by chance, was there a small one that I missed or something? And she says, no, but you just can't have a gun in here. And I asked her if there was a company policy for Hagen that prohibits weapons in her store, and she was not familiar with the company policy and couldn't tell me. And then I said, well, um, I'm disabled, and I had to walk all the way from the parking lot, and it's a lot of work for me to go back to take my weapon back there. And she goes, well, if you would do that, that would be fine. And I said, well, actually, I, I'm not required to do so. I said, I uh, have certain rights. I said, we have the Second Amendment of the Constitution, and we have the uh, Arizona Constitutional Carry Law, and uh, you don't have a sign prohibiting it. Um, Are you telling me that I'm not welcome in here as a customer? Uh, Are you telling me that I'm trespassing? She said, no, just get your gun out of here. So I I tried to explain to her that, you know, she was ignorant of gun laws and also uh, she was insulting me as a customer, and she put her hand up to my face like this and told me, you know, I'm not having any of this. Um, And she started... Did she touch you? Excuse me, did did she touch you physically? Do you have a physical contact with this? uh, No, no? more of a... Like when... Just talk to the hand, you know. She yeah. just put that up, and she said she didn't want to hear any more. Just get the gun out. I don't, I don't want to be touched by a woman like that. You know, it would be for me. Oh, assault, me either. You know, she came close to touching me. Wow. And I 
attempted to educate her on the constitutional laws and let her know that she was causing me uh, basically a, a big uh, interruption to have to go back to my car as a handicapped person. And I walk with a cane most of the time, and I'm in a lot of pain, so mm-hmm. um, I didn't understand the inconvenience. And then she told me in a loud voice to get my gun out of here. And I was trying to talk to her when the other clerk started sounding in as well. And it got so loud I could barely hear any talking at all. Wow. Um, At this point, several other clerks were yelling at me and I couldn't hear anything. And I said, well, I'm leaving and I think you violated my rights today. And I said, you'll probably hear from an attorney. And they were screaming at me when I left. Wow. So out of the store and I went out to my truck and my wife was still shopping inside so I tried to call her on her cell phone and mm-hmm. unfortunately she had left it at home and my son answered it yeah. so while I was waiting for her um, I was thinking what should I do next and I thought well you know my rights have been violated and I've responded to calls when I was a police officer when people felt their rights were violated and I just called the Flagstaff Police Department <laughs> and I asked them would you be willing to come out no. and take and they were very calm on the phone with me and they uh, took the information and I thought that's fine and while I'm waiting for my wife I'll just talk to them when they show up the problem was when the police arrived there were about four patrol cars and they arrived in tactical formations oh my gosh Um, several officers approached me other ones took different positions as if they were going to draw guns on me and I didn't see anybody literally draw a gun on me but I saw hands on holsters and they were ready to shoot and uh, when I spoke to the officer who was ahead on the call he was a lead officer he disarmed me he took my gun off of me he told me to keep my hands in plain view and then I was detained for about an hour as they conducted an investigation and as this investigation progressed you know I'd given him my identification I'd given him my concealed weapons permit I was fully cooperating I was polite Um, I realized that this was kind of odd if I was the victim and I said look I said this is kind of strange I said do you guys always do this to victims when they call they said you're not the victim and I said I'm your reporting party and they said well actually you're not somebody inside the store called and they stated that a crazy man was in there with a gun, waving it around, threatening customers. Oh, my gosh. This is so bad. This is so bad. I mean, for what, what you're telling me, you know, according to your witnessing, I wasn't there, of course. I mean, th- this is like they are f- bringing false information and false witnessing to, to the situation. I mean, this is a real – if you were threatening people, that's a real uh, uh, felony there. I mean, that's not a game, okay? It's not a joke. But uh, question before we go ahead, you know uh, – This is very disturbing because now, did you have any witness, first of all, during this conversation with this manager? Well, I would say there were several customers that were around. And Mm -hmm. uh, when I was out there talking to the officers after they Uh de-escalated, people came up to me and they said, Sir, we support you. You're open carry. We do that in the state. And we noticed that you're a veteran because they saw my my." the United States Marine Corps, yeah. and they said, you know, this is wrong what they did to you, and so uh, they were witnesses. Wow, that's good. At least, you know, and was, I'm, I'm looking from outside. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not, uh, uh, you know, law enforcement, just a person, you know, try to see from what you tell me what's going on. My humble opinion, what I think, first of all, what we can do, what we should have done. First of all, yes, in my humble opinion, for what I see, they should, if, the, if they don't want people with guns in their store, they need to put a sign, okay? That's uh, their right to lose business or make money the way they want. It's their private property. I respect that. But as you said, you know, you were already inside. There are no signs. And they ask you now to, especially with your um, physical incapa- you know, handicap that you have with your back problem, uh, you need to go back all the way to the car just because they cannot provide the sign. Why? If I was the manager, I would say, listen, the next time, don't come back with a gun. We will put a sign, but now just stay there. Everything's cool. Finish what you have to do. I mean, I would even do that. If I was the manager, say, don't worry, stay here. But the point is, they do not, they do not provide a sign. But they give you, of course, they, they, whatever answer they want. They, are, they hate guns, and they don't want guns. They told you to leave. Now, the police, when they came there, they were pretty cooperative. They told me, well, we understand, they were pretty understanding. But they say something that somebody filed uh, charges against you or not? Well, what was after 
uh, talking for a little bit, uh, I was told that a report had been taken and that the manager wanted me arrested for trespassing. Wow. And so I had specifically addressed that issue when I was in the store. I said, yes. am I trespassing? Do yeah. you want me here? And she says, no, that's not the problem. She says, I just don't want the gun here. Uh-huh. So uh, I don't know where all of a sudden they've changed their mind other than the fact that they uh, decided to get very rude with me and they got loud and I reciprocated, you know, I, you're allowed to speak your mind and talk the way you want. Mm -hmm. When people are gruff with you, sometimes they only back to, as a police officer, I've experienced that and I wanted to maintain control of the situation. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to have some uh, left-wing liberal lecture me uh, about her uh, ignorance of the law. So they told me that they wanted to press charges. I said, so are you going to arrest me? I said, on what charge? And they said, no, no, uh, through speaking with you and your demeanor, we believe that there's some inconsistent statements that was were given by the store. Uh-huh. You have to take a report, but it's going to go to the local district attorney. Okay. And they decision as to whether they're going to press charges. And I said, what kind of charges? And they said, uh, either uh, disturbing the peace or, um, um, I'm sorry, either disturbing the peace. Or trespassing. Or, I'm sorry? Or, or trespassing, right? I mean, uh, criminal trespassing. Could... Yeah, and I said, well, neither of those things took place. I said they would need signs for me to have even done any of this. Mm -hmm. And they did not tell me I had to leave. They told me I had to take the gun out. And I yeah. was in process of doing that when yeah. I left. So yeah. I don't see how they could come to this conclusion. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, you know, sometimes stories change. And I said, of course they do. I said, particularly when people make things up. Yeah. So let me tell you something. You know, first of all, I would like to say something to my listeners, to our listeners. You know, I just bring you now, of course, one side of this story. And uh, I don't ask you to believe everything I'm saying or Mike Hayes is saying. But I, I would like to use your brain. And maybe it's time to call uh, and ask the other side of this story to these uh, Hagen stores. Because even just asking questions, when people... Um, in my opinion, from what they see from your side and what I can believe, I think that at least they deserve a phone call to ask, am I allowed to carry a gun in your store, yes or not? And the point is, that's not anything political, that's not anything about taking side with anybody, but that's showing that we, as the gun owners, we can still ask questions and we can still decide how we use our dollars. So I would like to invite everybody to call Haggins, H-A-G-G-E-N-S, in Flagstaff. And I have the phone number, 928-773-1834, 928-773-1834. And you don't even need to bring up now my case in this situation. Just ask, am I allowed to exercise my Second Amendment for self-defense? In, in, uh, in, forget about self-defense. Am I allowed to use, uh, exercise my Second Amendment in your store? And according to what they say, you can give them the answer that they deserve. Normally, what I like to do that, to remind that many of us gun owners, even if they don't see that we carry a gun, because, you know, we do not even need a concealed permit anymore in this state. We have a constitutional carry law. We can carry as law-abiding citizen without permit. So I would let them know that if I'm not allowed to carry a gun in their store, I'm not going to sit down like a sitting duck in their store. And for sure, the last thing I will do is spend even one dime in their store. Maybe just uh, my voice, but guess what? Maybe if there are more than my voice out there, they may start to get the hint a little bit. I understand they're already out of business, so no really big deal. Probably they're going to be gone anyway. But I think it's important we show that my case is not alone. It's not the only gun owner in the area who, who likes to spend his money in that shop. So I would like to ask, please, every listener, start to call and start to ask if that store allows or not to carry a gun. If they say no, you say what you want. Number two, if you want to go a little deeper, why not? You can say, I listen to the show, Love, Guns, and Freedom. I listen to the, I heard the my case uh, witnessing at least this side of the story. And I would like to speak with the manager. Do you have the, main, the name of the manager, Mike? I believe it was Sally. Sally. Anyway, a manager. A manager who interacted with Mr. Mike Ace, the gun-toting guy that uh, supposedly you had to call the police because it was so dangerous to your store. So, And when you gather on the phone, Sally, normally the manager is their job to be on the phone. Be polite, but be straight. What are you doing? 
What are you doing? Seriously, moron. Why are you pressing charges against this person? That, by the way, is a disabled veteran. That all he was trying to do was trying to shop and spend these dollars at your stupid shop. And why are you trying to be so mean and so uh, mentally unstable that you're afraid of a gun? When the guy is there, you know that also. But regardless, why do you have to call the cops and create all the drama? The guy was leaving. Regardless, you, you say what you want, but I think it's important in a polite way we interact with these people. Let them know that their sa salary, their paycheck, come from our dollar. We may not vote with them uh, at political level because that's a private business, but I really believe that with our dollar we can still have a big influence. But I'm not surprised, Mike. The city of Flagstaff, you know, besides few exceptions, I'm sure there are good cops out there that they understand that it's on a constitution and the Bill of Rights. Unfortunately, the city council is a pack of rats, and they're all completely, uh, for me, they belong to some, I don't know, Chinese uh, Bolshevik revolution movie. I mean, I'll give you a name, okay? There is a, one of the city council, her name is Eva Putsova, okay? The declared socialist, the, who she wants to do gun legislation, gun uh, restriction laws in Flagstaff, even... She wants to completely challenge the preemptive state laws that we have in the city of Arizona. So technically, the city of council of Flagstaff cannot rewrite gun laws in, this, in the city, but she's able, she, she said that she was willing to challenge that. So I'm not surprised uh, that uh, shops and people around there, they are kind of, not everybody, but uh, it's kind of a strange environment. What do you think? Do you feel that type of, do you live in the city or outside the city of Flagstaff? Where do you live? Well, I live in the county, and uh, I don't vote in the city elections, okay. but uh, that does concern me because we have uh, NAU right here, uh, Northern Arizona University, yeah. and a lot of university types today that are very Marxist, and they believe in weapons confiscation, yeah. and, uh, they believe in socialism, and, and we need to speak out on these issues because this is definitely one of them. I agree, and this is exactly the way these these uh, these worms get inside our system and start to destroy it. Even the state of Arizona, that we sh we are the number one state when it comes down to gun laws. Look what they're doing in the city of Flagstaff, and look how they're changing their even the. I mean, if every business, you know, they try to do this crap. For example, a national bank here in Mojave County, they try to do a Staples. They try to do it. For example, another bank, the Mojave State Bank, a few years ago. But enough good people. Uh, and I don't want to take credit, but at least I was one of them, okay? We went there, we tried to communicate with the manager, we tried to communicate with the vice president, for example, the Moave State Bank, and in a few days or a few weeks, things, they were back to normal. Their gun sign, I mean, their gun-free zone sign was gone. But it was a struggle, because if nobody, uh, anybody didn't want to, didn't want to get involved, uh, we would have now, for example, uh, many of these businesses that, that you cannot allow anymore to have a gun, and even if you live in the state of Arizona, you realize that private business, they're going to cut you off anyway. So we got to get involved. I'm saying again, listeners, this is serious. I'm not saying to believe anything I'm saying or what my case is saying, but at least call Hagen's 928-773-1834. I beg you, make a phone call, ask for the manager, be polite, but be straight. Ask why we are not allowed to carry a gun there, law-abiding people. A reminder that the scumbag, the criminal scumbag, it's not, it doesn't care about their sign. They, they, they don't care about their, their, their will. They will come with the guns, and especially when there is a gun-free zone, they would love to have that area because they can do better robberies and better murdering without being challenged. So that's the point. And more important, ask also why you've been a jerk with Mr. Mike Hayes. That's a very important question too. Mike, I want to leave you the floor. you got three minutes. You can say whatever you want, and I'll shut up. I would just like to say that I did contact customer relations through the Internet at Hagen's Foods, and that's Hagen's Customer Inquiries at HagenFoods.com. Mm -hmm. And the response to me was real simple. It said, thank you for your message. We will be responding to your email by the next business day. However, it's our goal to reply sooner. Regards, Hagen Customer Care. Uh, as of this time right now, and I... I don't have my watch in front of me. I, I can tell you they've not contacted me back since then, and I've received no answer. And I was asking about their policy for firearms. So they're avoiding me at this point, and they failed to live up to their promise. And, you know, the thing that really concerns me about this whole incident, there's a term for what happened to me yesterday. Mm -hmm. It's called swatting. And if you're not familiar with that term, swatting is when gun activists, you know, anti-handgunners, 
decide they're going to take matters into their own hands. And what they do is, since they can't uh, violate the law, they use sneaky tactics like if they see a person with a gun out in public, they will call the police or the sheriff and they'll report a crime in progress. Mm-hmm. And what happens is the police show up in force. They're usually uh, very concerned. Their adrenaline is flowing. I mean, I remember when I was a police officer, uh, when I went to a scene of a possible shooting or a gun involved, your adrenaline's up. Yeah. And if you move wrong or you don't follow their exact commands, you can get shot. Yeah. And serious. And this is what they're doing to legal gun owners that are carrying guns now. And if you check the Internet, a lot of people have been encouraging people to do this. This is what they did to me. They made a false report Mm -hmm. when they said I was waving my gun around. My wife was with me. It's not my character. I don't use drugs. I'm not an alcoholic. I was not acting out. I was not uh, unholstering my weapon. My weapon was where it belongs in its holster, like a fire extinguisher there if I needed it. So as of 2.42 p.m. Uh, today, I've had absolutely no response from Hagen's in regards to this incident. Perfect. And uh, one thing I forgot to say, you know, this is my personal experience. One tool, one very important tool that probably we will use, uh, hopefully we will use much more often than the handgun, it's a video camera. Because uh, if all this uh, interaction between you and the manager was on record, on video, Right now, that lady, uh, she would never have the chance to somehow twist the facts like she's trying to do, okay? So that's very important, you know, and there's many now, the technology is so advanced and so affordable. You can get for $30 like a video pen. I mean, Mike, I would suggest you to get, I always have on me at least a couple of video cameras. One is big, one is small. But the point is, when you see problems on the way, especially in situations that could be kind of uh, confrontational, let the video go. Because even just the audio, even just a little tape recorder, everything's there. You go in front of the police or in front of a county attorney or city attorney, you have the evidence. That's black and white. That's not an opinion. So, my friends, listeners, you know, in case you fa- face yourself, let's learn from this experience. You know, let's try always to have witnesses with us. Or if you, if you don't have witness, always have at least a video camera or some audio recording there. So that's all I want to say. Mike, I pray for you, and uh, please keep me updated with the results of all this situation with the city of Flagstaff. And uh, I'll let you know anyway. I will call the, this uh, manager. I will call him probably right now as, as I finish this call, okay? So I'll let you know how it goes, and I hope everybody out there will call this uh, despicable or despicable, I don't know call it in English, Hagen store, and I hope they go out of business for real, and maybe we can get some real stores there, okay? Thank you, Mike. Well, thank you, Luca. It's been a pleasure talking to you again and seeing you again. Thank you. Anyway, guys, don't go away because right now I'm going to make the phone call to Haggins right now. And I will ask for the manager. I will be polite. I hope with my accent she can understand what I'm trying to fumble around. And we will go through this phone call right now. You're listening to Love, Guns, and Freedom with Luca Zan. Okay, I'm calling. 928 <laughs> Seven seven three seven nine five five. This is the right number for Hagen's in Flagstaff. Again, nine two. Thank you for calling Hagen. This is Lars. How can I help you? Yes, I. Good afternoon. My name is Luca Zanna. I would like to speak, please, with the manager, Sally. Okay. Terrible music. I wouldn't shop just because of the music. I'm calling Haggins. Hello. Hello, hello. Okay, guys, uh, you know, this is. Uh, I, I took it off. The phone keeps ringing, ringing, and ringing, and that's fine. Maybe they're closing out of business, but please try to call anyway. Maybe Hagen's headquarters and try again. You know, I'm on the show now. I can stay ten minutes on uh, the air waiting for somebody answer to the phone. So call Hagen's 
and hopefully you can get somebody and let them know, by the way, do you have a sign or not? If you have a sign, please post the sign so it's pretty much in plain view, we can see it. And more important, let them know, you know, if you have a sign, no guns allowed, uh, express your feelings if you really want to go to shop in a place where people, law-abiding people are disarmed. Because remember, at the end of the day, criminals do not care about the sign. Or maybe, yes, they do care, because they love signs like that. So they know that the only person with a weapon is going to be the, themselves and everybody else is unarmed. So it's the time to stand up together. Let's uh, find out what really is going on Hagens in Flagstaff and tell him what you think. And maybe you should also try to help out a little bit. My case, you know, at the end of the day, tomorrow could happen to you what's happening to him, okay? You're listening to Love, Guns, and Freedom with Lucas Zana. Now we have a caller. He wants to say something about guns. And I'm always willing, willing and looking for people who want to call. Don't forget, if you want to be on the show, just go to my website, lovegunsfreedom.com. Send me an email. Zanna at zanna.us and I'll be happy to bring you up. Okay? Now here we go. Here we go, guys. This is the second part of the second hour Love Guns and Freedom with Lucas Zanna. Uh, this is now gonna be a little bit more about uh, technical practical things. You know, if you have a rifle, and you should have a rifle, if you listen to this show, I hope you can have more than one rifle, maybe a fam- family of rifles. But you know, at the end of the day, you have only two arms. You must have your main rifle. I hope your rifle is zero in. Because, you know, the importance to have a rifle zero in, it's vital. You're not going to have the time and the, the, to zero in your rifle in the moment of need. And what does exactly mean zero in the rifle? And how do you zero in the rifle? And there are different rifles out there, of course. Today I would like to focus mostly on the platform of uh, the M1A or M14, the military version of the M14. My favorite rifle, by the way. Chamber in 308 or 762 by 51. The battlefield rifle for excellence. And I have with me one of my guests that in the past you know, has been very helpful to share a lot of good information about reloading and different ideas on preparation. Today I would like to ask him his help for his help to talk about how how, what type of system, what type of method he uses to zero in his uh, M1A slash M14. His name is Tim Seaworth from, uh, I think he's Indiana, I forgot, Michigan. It's Tim, where are you from? I forgot. Wisconsin. Wisconsin, oh my God, I was completely spaced out. I was out two hours in the heat. And my brain is fusing. Anyway, good to see you again, Tim. How are you? Oh, hear from you. How are you? I am well, Luca. Thank you. How are you? Pretty good. You know, a little tired. You know, when I go to town, it's always, uh, for me, it's like in a journey. I hate going to town, especially when I go in buildings like the USPS. You know, it's kind of a stressful drama. You know, no fr- gun-free zone. And, of course, they don't even give you the option to, uh, you know, you're stuck with them, at least, you know, if you want to ship uh, mail uh, regular letters, you know. so But they disarm you, and then you need to leave your gun in the truck and get it back. And meanwhile... The incompetence is kind of always at its best. But regardless, I digress. Let's talk about this topic. First of all, what is your main rifle uh, that you consider your rifle? Well, my my main rifle is also uh, the M14 at slash M1A. Uh, it's, that is the rifle I originally learned how... I shoot. Uh, long. I, I will. It was a long, long time ago. Yeah. So we talk about that. I remember in the past, our first interview, you told me about that, and that's why I was kind of, you know, also interested because I know that you have really experience here. When even when you were in the service with that rifle. Now, uh, do how do you zero? your M1A slash M14. Do you have a system, a particular system? Can you share your system with our yeah. audience? Yeah. Yeah, I, I usually, what, what's referred to, I leave my 200 yard zero on my rifle. I have shot hundreds and hundreds of rifle matches mm-hmm. with the M1A. As a matter of fact, I've I've gone through two barrels wow. on one M1A. That's how many matches I've shot with an M1A. Anyway, I usually leave a 200-yard zero on my rifle. Now, first of all, I would I would like to 
deviate just for a moment here, and that is is that it was, it's my habit that I would clean my rifle mm-hmm. after after every match, and typically uh, an NRA rifle match is an 80-shot match with sighters, so you end up shooting 88 rounds. You know, close to 100 rounds, so that's, that's quite a bit of shooting, so you should clean your rifle after that much. But I don't always clean the gas system after every, after every match. Mm-hmm. I would generally, when I was clean a lot of shooting, I would clean the gas system after every other match, mm-hmm. after about every 200 rounds or so. Wow. Okay. After that point, after that point, the um, the gas piston and the the face of the uh, gas plug get pretty carboned up, and also the end of the operat gets pretty carboned up mm-hmm. after you've shot about two hundred rounds. So the reason why I said that is because a a dirty rifle and a dirty gas system in particular will affect your how your rifle shoots. Mm-hmm. That's that's the reason why I put that in. And my 200-yard zero is uh, six clicks up from the bottom. Okay. You, you turn, turn the elevation knob all the way down and... Uh, you just you just come up six clicks, and that typically is for a uh, a a center mass hold. I when I shoot rifle matches, when I shoot when I used to shoot with an M one A, I didn't uh, I don't hold six o'clock like a lot of people do, and like a lot like like a lot of people have taught. It was it was always my my idea, my mindset that if I if I want the bullet to go in the middle of the target, mm-hmm. then that's where I'm going to aim. Mm-hmm. So I would hold, I would hold the center, center of the target with the top of the front set, and that's the reason why I only come up six clicks. Okay. Uh, if you're holding, if you're holding uh, a six o'clock hold, then you need to come up two more clicks. Mm-hmm. Exactly, exactly. So question is, you know, I, I normally I do my first uh, pre-zero, at least my close distance zero at 25 yards, and then I, cur- I let's say, finalize it or verify it at 200 yards. We're talking about with a general basic uh, 762 by 51 or 308 ball, you know, 147 grain or so, basic round. Uh, do you ever do the 25 yards uh, uh uh, pre-zero, as I, I call it. I don't know if it's the right term, but that's the way I call it. No, no, I never. Well, I've shot at Camp Perry several times, and I, I when when you go to Camp Perry, mm-hmm. they have uh, they have what they call a small arms firing school, and requirement to attend the small arms firing school at Camp Perry if it's your first time there. Wow, that's pretty so, exciting. And that's that's with that's with an F sixteen and at twenty five meters. Mm-hmm. I'm just curious um, I have never been at, at uh Camp Perry. You know is it open to the well, public is open to the public? Can you go there? Um anybody, oh, yeah. anybody can yeah, it's open to the public. Wow. But it's not it's not like it used to be, mm-hmm. unfortunately, like like just about everything else. I mean when I the first time I went to Camp Perry was uh, 25 years ago, mm-hmm. and it was the, the rifle, the high power rifle portion of Camp Perry is two weeks long. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the total of Camp Perry, the, the national matches, is over five weeks long. But the rifle, the high power rifle portion, is two weeks long, and the first week is referred to or used to be referred to as board week and that's that was when back in the day when they used to issue you your ammunition Mm -hmm. and they they stopped doing that uh, 
I don't remember exactly when, but they stopped doing that a number of years ago, uh, mostly because so many people started using ARs. <clears throat> but because the only ammunition that they would issue was uh, 762 by 51 or 30 caliber for the M1 Grand. Mm-hmm. That was the only ammunition that they would issue. Okay. And there's uh, there's four matches for the first week during board week, and then the second week is referred to as NRA week when they have the NRA National Championship. Mm-hmm. And what that is, is it's three 80-shot matches for a total of 240 shots for a total possible score of two of 2,400 points shot over a four-day period. Wow. And that's, that's what that is. I've never done that. Really <clears throat> good. Question now, you know, uh, if I can have you a question about I, I wanna, Go ahead, finish, please. Go ahead. Um, as far as zeroing the, the M1A, what you need to do, I mean, if, if you have a new rifle and it's your first time to go to the range, mm-hmm. you need to take, you need to take a, uh, I can't remember the exact size there. You can move the front sight by loosening the little, there's a little set screw, a little Allen head set screw mm-hmm. on the front sight. And if you loosen that, you can move it, uh, to the left or the right, and you really need to have the front side adjusted for a no-wind zero, what's referred to as a no-wind zero. And how you do that is is you, hopefully, you, you shoot, you do this when there's no wind blowing. I know that's, you know, that's not always feasible, but theoretically, you should do this when there's no wind blowing. And... You have you start out with the rear sight in the middle, according to the little hatch marks on the bottom of the rear sight, and you move the front sight so that you're shooting in the middle with without moving the rear sight, and then you have your front sight zeroed for a no win zero. Okay, you're, and you really need to do that. And the reason why I say this is because. There can be a significant uh, discrepancy in in your zero for your front sight on the M1A. Um, as a matter of fact, I have I have an M1A that where the front sight is noticeably over to one side for a no wind zero. Mm-hmm. And the reason why you do this is so that you have the maximum amount of adjustment, windage adjustment, in your rear sight. Exactly. So that you start out when you're shooting, if you start out shooting a batch or whatever, you have your rear sight in the center, and then you have your maximum adjustment either way, because obviously if you don't do this, then you're going to be at a disadvantage on one side or the other. Okay. Makes sense. Question I have, uh, first of all, is it important uh, I, uh, when you zero your rifle, I see many people zeroing from uh, the bench, I like to zero my rifle from uh, my prone position because normally I never shoot with the bench. Uh, what do you do, your personal experience? I believe that it's better to, yes, zero your rifle from a prone position. And the reason why is because unless... Your rifle is bedded and a double lug rifle that it doesn't move, the sling will have an effect mm-hmm. on, on your rifle and how it shoots. Um, it, it's going to be like, if you throw it off a bench, then you go and shoot in a prone position using a sling in there like you're supposed to and you have a good prone position. It's going to be differently. Exactly. And, you, know, Greg, you, you won't you won't see much of a difference at 200 yards. But if you go back to five, 600 yards, mm-hmm. you will definitely see. 
Exactly. That's why I like to keep it consistent. Normally, I shoot with the without, without benches. You know, especially for real shooting, never use a bench. But uh, then I see many people that like to use the bench, and then I say, guys, are you going to carry that bench with you on the field in the moment of needs, or is this is just for hobby? I mean, that's another story. Very important point. Thank you. And also another question. You know, it's important to keep at least consistent the grains. You know, I'm not talking about shooting for matches here. I'm just talking about to have a, a rifle for, you know, battlefield rifle, zero in. So it would be nice to have at least a consistency in the grains and the quality of ammunition, correct or not? What do you think? Oh, yes. I, that definitely has has a bearing on the, on the whole scheme of things. If you're going to... Uh, if you're just going to go and buy some military surplus ammunition from some foreign place, you're not going to you're, you're not going to get as good a result as if you were going to go to all the pains of of loading your own ammo that you that is that is possible to do. I mean, you know, weighing every case, you know, sorting your cases and weighing every powder charge and everything that I go into in my second book. Yes. And let's, uh, talk, let's remind a little bit because, you know, you wrote two books. You are an expert in two reloading. I mean, that's what you've been doing for many, many years. You wrote two books about it. Please give me your main website where also people can find your articles. You have a lot of great articles there. Please go ahead. Give your website out. My website is real easy to remember. It's 1776men.com. Perfect. 1776men.com. Very good. And I have a question for you. You know, in one of your, a uh, few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, you told me that you went to Walmart and you bought uh, a brand of ammo that I bought myself, but I wasn't able to, sh- able to shoot it yet. I want to try it out. It's the ZQ1, uh, 762 by 51. I think they are from Turkey. Uh, they are, yeah. They look beautiful, I'll tell you. I haven't, you. Did you shoot them? I haven't had a chance either. Okay. <laughs> I haven't had a chance to try it either. All right, because I like the price. I, I like the way they feel, I, the way they look. You know, it's all brass, and uh, I forgot the grains, but it looks like a standard 762 by 51. And the price was fair. It was like $9.99 or something like that. I was pretty excited about the quality from outside, but I was hoping uh, to find somebody who would, uh, could shoot it. You know, it's... Uh, 147 grain full metal jacket, reloadable. So it's worth also for the brass for people that, uh, like yourself, that, you know, you reload. So just curious about it. And, uh, I don't know. That would be maybe a good brand, uh, if it works, like they say, you know, to, to, to get. They have also, by the way, I found online, they also have, uh, 556 by 45, the SSS, excuse me, the SS109 or M8, M855 for metal jacket with steel penetrator. And they go for like, uh, let's say, 1,200 round directly from Z- ZQIMO.com for about $432. That not a bad price for buying stuff out of the box, especially if it's good quality. Uh, this is a still penetrate of the, the green tip. So anyway, so Lisa, I really appreciate it because, you know, I really hope everybody out there who has a rifle, at least your main rifle, it's zero in. Now, when you got your battlefield at zero, you know, at 200 yards for your M1A, let's say when you go to, you progress, you go to 300, 400, 500. How you, do you maneuver your, um, are you, are you doing like some sort of a Kentucky uh, windage or let's say, or you also use, of course, your rear sight adjustment. Oh, I I always adjust my sights. Okay, and what is that? Uh, go ahead. Wait, I'll, the standard, I'll, go ahead. The standard. I'm sorry. The standard come up from 200 to 300 yards is three clicks. Oh. Oh, three clicks, exactly. When you go to uh, 400 or I'll, I'll, I'll uh, 500, how much do you do you go up? Well, I'll have to admit that I've never, I haven't done much shooting at 400 and 500 yards. As a matter of fact, I've only shot one rifle match at 500 yards. Okay. Uh, most of my shooting beyond 300 yards has been at 600 yards and beyond. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, my standard come up from 300 to 600 yards yes. is 11 clicks. Mm-hmm. And, and then for, uh, 500 yards, I remember it was, uh, Eight or eight and a half from okay. three hundred yards. So 
probably somewhere for 400 yards and probably somewhere in between there. It's probably four or five clicks up from 300 to 400 yards. Okay, perfect, sure. perfect. This is a, and remember, guys, you got experimented with the, with your rifle and uh, with your ammunition, and uh, that's the very important thing. It takes a little time, but it's an important process. Do you have any article? I know you have a lot of beautiful articles on your website. Do you have any article about how to side in your M1 Garand or M1A rifle? No, I just have a... Okay. I, I have an article for about loading... Okay. Loading ammo. Yes, I saw that. For the M1, the M1A. Yes, but right. I don't have, I don't have any, uh, article any real thing. shooting, shooting, you know, how to shooting articles yet on my website. I've been. Okay. I found a good article, at least seems like a good article. I want to double check it, uh, on fulton-armory.com. Uh, and I will post that also the link on uh, lovegansfreedom.com. How to zero in your M1A. And this is something, you know, every one of you guys have different tips of experience. Please share them. If you want to be on the air, I welcome you. Uh, my only goal here is, uh, you know, to share information with all of us. Because, you know, to, ever, to be the best rifleman in town, it doesn't really help the cause of freedom. I wish every person, every law-abiding person who believes in freedom, who believes in, in uh, defending this republic, is, uh, is a good uh, uh, potential rifleman. That's the only way we can deter a tyranny. So we are here to share this information. So anybody that say, hey, guys, I know another system, another way, easier, whatever, give me a call, or even better, send me an email. Go to lovegansfreedom.com. There is my email there, and uh, I'll be happy to bring you up. Everything that, uh, and I don't care if you are with a school or without school. I'm not here to, to pimp or, or push anybody. I just want to give good information out to my listeners so you can become better uh, law-abiding people that will understand how to use weapons for self-defense or to defend freedom. I want to give you the floor. And I want to thank you. You got one minute, Tim, whatever you want to say. I would just like to say uh, please visit my website, 1776men.com. It's an online magazine. It's free. I don't, I don't ask for any donations or anything like a lot of other places and I never will. It will always be free. The information, I just put it out there, all the information on my website, that because I think it's, uh, it's valuable and necessary. Perfect, and I really appreciate your time and your help. Guys, you're listening to Love, Guns, and Freedom with Lucas Zanna. Now, don't go away. There's a little bit of music, and then we go for our number three. This is going to be a very important hour. Today, about love is going to be love for your fellow human, for your fellow neighbor, for me, people who are ready to stand for freedom. You remember what happened at the Bundys uh, last year or so? Guess what? Now, the same situation, it's happening here in Moave County. I met a person, the man, who's standing against the BLM and for the principal that is refusing to pay for fees that's supposed to be not a privilege by right anyway. You will see it. We are really need everybody. That's why this is the hour of love. I will bring him in. And I hope every one of us start to decide how we're going to stand up together as free Americans. Don't go away. You're listening to Love, Guns, and Freedom with Lucas Now we know the truth. And we are not afraid of you. You can try to take our body. But you will never take our soul. You will never take our freedom. You will never take our pride. We will defeat you. Long live to the Republic. Death to the new world order. John Lucasana, December the 17th, 2009. More on the county, Arizona.
He's a songwriter, a poet, a rifleman, I'm not afraid. and a constitutional activist. I'm not afraid. Italian by birth, I'm not afraid. American by choice, Jean-Luc Gazzana. I'm not afraid. And his new CD, Love, Guns, and Fear. 16 powerful songs on one CD from the heart of a patriot. For download or to order the CD, go to www.lovegunsfreedom.com. That's www.lovegunsfreedom.com. Lyrics for your mind, music for your heart. John Luca Zana's new CD, Love, Guns, and Freedom. Have you ever met someone on an online dating site and thought, wow, this guy is perfect for me, or she is simply amazing, only to find out they were hiding a deep, dark secret? They plan to vote for Hillary. Freedomlovers.us was created for singles who want to exchange ideas and a love for freedom. People who are looking for solutions to create and defend freedom in the real world and at the same time getting that once in a lifetime chance to find their true soulmate. Whether you are interested in meeting your soulmate, making new friends, networking, or hanging out with that like-minded liberty lover, visit freedomlovers.us. It's the first free dating site and community. So patriots, don't waste your time with other dating sites. Freedomlovers.us is the place where like-minded singles really guys. Can. Now we are at hour number three. This is the hour about love and also means solutions. And I like always to bring uh, people who wants to say your opinion or your input to find ideas, you know, to find solutions. You know, we're trying to, uh, together and as individuals to find the way to stop tyranny and to get our rights back. And this is happening all over the world, as I said. By the way, there is not, uh, I don't have any type of uh, filtering here. You can come here, and especially if you disagree with me, I welcome you. Just be civil. Let's just be also respectful to the radio station uh, rules by the FCC, so let's not cuss and things like that. But I really want people that have differences of opinion, even things, of course, we agree on the air. So this is the purpose of also the show. Now, I have a great guy. He's been uh, also a Facebook friend for a while with me and also was one of my first uh, uh, guests on freedomlovers.us, very smart young man, Marty Fisher, that he will tell you in which state he's calling from. It seems like he has some great ideas about solutions against the new world order. Let's see what he has to say. Marty, are you there? Yes, uh, I'm here. How you uh, doing? I didn't know I was one of your first guests on air. I mean, you know, one of the first, at least when we st- I started, that there was a... Uh, uh, feature normally had women. I wanted to start to feature young men and men, and that you were one of the first guys, you know, good looking young people. Okay, let's put it in this way. So tell me, Marty, what's going on, first of all? What is the, the reason of the call? Any ideas, any solution, any input, whatever you want to say? All right, so I noticed there's everything was still going downhill. I mean, just the government's not doing its best, but I mean, what else do you expect? It's almost like it's supposed to be that way. Mm-hmm. Y- you see families breaking up, you see everything just breaking down and just going to complete garbage. So me and a couple of friends started brainstorming what we can do. So we looked at different examples throughout history and different examples throughout literature, both real and not real, mm-hmm. on what systems worked and what systems did not work. And well, the, and if you want to look it down to what human beings are at its base level, I mean, you look at people who want to look at their nationalities, you want people who want to look at what city they're from. Human beings are tribal creatures. Mm-hmm. So we first started thinking, okay, tribes. I mean, you look at tribes, they're most of the time close-knit. So we formed this idea on one way to rebel against the way things are going downhill. Okay, go ahead. Bringing back the family at its core value. I mean, it used to be, I mean, you look back at the Hatfields and the McCoys, I mean, there was always a central figure with that always, you know, taught, pretty much ruled the family and things went along smoothly. Family matters went down smoothly. Mm -hmm. So we bring back the family. So what else made America great? Because right now we we want to eventually bring this idea out into the world, but we need to beta test everything here in America first. Mm -hmm. It's one of the things that made America great. Well, we had superior products and people used to actually work 
hard to make their living. People would actually build things great, so why don't we bring back the commerce? Okay. Well, if you look at Gerald Salente, he talked about how you used to have small businesses. Mm -hmm. Like, there would be a family butcher. Yes. Family barbers, not these uh, over-the-top salons that you find the same salon in, like, 20 different cities. Mm -hmm. So instead of, like, you know, going to, like, a high V to get your pre-cut crap meat, we start going back to more quality products, like hometown butchers who would catch you the right cut and know exactly what... You and your family wanted something like that. Okay. But at the same time, we also had to think, okay, how does this go back and harken to it's the family? Yeah, how do we do that? You know, there is a plan, and what you're saying is true, because the globalists, they've been planning the destruction of the family a long time ago, at the early beginning of the century, because they want to substitute the family with the state. So that's the bottom line. That's why they wanted, at the beginning, you know, the women to work, these bankers, they were so ex- concerned about the women's rights to work, you know, to vote. They wanted to have the Rockefeller. They all they wanted to have, first of all, more people paying taxes. You know, that's the bottom line after the creation of the Federal Reserve Act. And also, very important, what they really wanted was uh, uh, the destruction of the family. If, uh, more mom and pop, they bought work. The, the 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 kids, the little children, they must go under the surveillance and the education or re-education program of the state. That's why it's so hard. And also, you know, I, I don't care about gay issues. It's really I'm not my problem. I mean, they can do whatever they want. But, you know, something that you're born gay. Uh, but there is a plan now that you're, it's not just about being born gay because your DNA or your hormones, uh, they're it's different. It's pretty much forcing it nowadays. Yeah, now it's psychological. It's indoctrination because they want to destroy the family, you know, to reduce the population. Hey, hey, at school. Yeah, exactly. Like, my kid wants to go to school dressed up as a, in a dress. If, if I had a son who wanted to go to school dressed up in a... In a dress, mm-hmm. act like a girl. Uh, I tell him no, simply because, well, you're too young to understand what you're doing. But if you like boys, well, we'll talk about that another time. Yeah, exactly. When you want to understand things a little bit more. Exactly. But when you have the school telling you, guess what, you're going to celebrate gay day by cross-dressing for days. like, n- no, 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 no. If my son wants to do that, I will talk to him about that, and maybe, possibly, I'll decide, okay, fine, go ahead and do it. But the school forcing it, that irritates me, which also goes back to my idea of education. Mm -hmm. You look at the education system nowadays, not only do kids not learn anything, Mm -hmm. they're being indoctrinated into a bunch of garbage. So that also brought me to another idea. Yeah, tell me. You start bringing up building private schools that actually teach people rather than turning them into morons. And how would you make that attractive for any teacher that is actually good enough for this? Well, you treat teachers the same way you would treat good doctors, not these crap doctors that just put you on pills all the time. Mm-hmm. You treat them to the same level of reverence because that that's, to me, uh, being a teacher is more important than a lot of the other jobs that you see around here. It should be more revered and loved. Yeah. The but pro- you see teachers nowadays, I mean, they get the crap end of the stick. Mm-hmm. And probably, you know, now, you know, especially with this economy destroyed by design, and uh, the plan, you know, started with uh, before even NAFTA and CAFTA to destruction of the middle class. I, I think that people are going to have problem to even uh, afford the private schools. Maybe uh, home schools, especially in some states. Unfortunately, not every state is still uh, allowed to do it. Like California is very hard. But maybe home school would be even more feasible because a private school it can be very expensive if you don't have uh, the right income. You know. Well, that's why I was thinking, okay, how am I going to pull this off? Well, yeah. I already thought about how bringing back businesses. I mean, I got these ideas. I just don't know how to get a, get by them. So, you know, there's still a lot of research coming through here. Okay. I've mean, got the idea of what we want to do. We just don't have the plan set up, we, so, which we're still looking over this. But one thing that we all simultaneously agreed on, and that is how, whether or not the people should be armed, the people within these tribal groups of ours. And my thoughts were this. Unless the person is proven to be clinically just completely insane and shouldn't be near guns, everyone has a firearm. Say again. Everyone's how to use it. You start learning at a young age. Uh-huh. How to respect it. Because I, I know my family. Half my family is the typical redneck country boy. Okay. Uh, one of those same family members wanted to move into the city. Now he acts like he's from the hood. I remember him when he shot his first deer. 
Mm-hmm. He respects firearms, and he's better with gun safety than me. I didn't start shooting until I was about 19 years old. Mm-hmm. And he's still a better shot than me. Which, which state did you grow up? I grew up in Missouri. Missouri, okay. So your, your solution would be that uh, to teach every person how to use a, a weapon and to have a weapon. Is that correct? Uh, that's, that's, yeah. Yes, that, that's part of the idea. I agree. At least I'm with you. The problem is that you know, that would also solve a lot of uh, reducing the cost for homeland security. They will reduce the cost for police force. Because every law-abiding person knows how to uh, use a weapon and as a weapon and without you know, legislation trying to curb this right, that would be a much more safe society, a much more stronger country. But this is exactly what these globalists don't want. I mean, they, all these people in Washington and even different states, state government, they are fighting exactly against that. And they know it. But uh, question, how old are you? I forgot, Marty. I am now 24. The first time I actually appeared on here, I was 23 at the time period. I remember that. You're a young man. Why don't you think something that would be exciting? Because, you know, you have a great idea. So I believe that uh, exactly that's how people start to use this idea and practical start to use it. Uh, wherever you live, you know, I think it's feasible for a young man uh, when you got great ideas, you got the energy, uh, you got the desire to try to, to stop this uh, onslaught of, of, of tyranny. Why don't you start to run for local office, even city council? That would be a great opportunity for you to start to share your values in a local level and make changes in a good way. Because, you know, what you say, it's a great. But at the same time, you know, sometimes just putting it out there, it's great. It's good at philosophical level. But sometimes you can apply this at practical level in your community. And, uh, you know, you don't need to be rich when you run for a local position, especially in a small town. City council, you can have enough good people supporting you for your ideas. And that could be a very great uh, seed of uh, freedom because you could start to spread, spread these, these values at local level. And if anybody, start, everybody start to do the same a local, city, or county level, they would be living a much better America. Uh, are you planning to move to Arizona, I, I heard, correct? Yes, sir. I'm planning to move to Arizona. Any part? I, I think it's a great bonus because then I get to see you on the weekends. I'm <laughs> currently going to college. and Okay, where, where are you most going Most colleges, exactly? I'm going to say this right now, most of, most of the things that people want college degrees for now, it's a complete least stupid idea to go to college unless you want one of these big name jobs like being a doctor or psychologist yes or a lawyer things of that nature but to go to med school for two years and then be in debt for the next five years yeah at least five years. when also looking at the medical industrial complex and how it makes money by keeping people sick Mm -hmm. i was actually suggested by my parents to do this and they wouldn't understand what i meant but it's a raising business it's like i don't i consciously cannot allow myself to work for anything that's purposely keeping people sick, especially when that's pretty much what it seems like that happened to my grandmother when she died. Mm-hmm. Every single time they, uh, when my grandmother was dying, mm. that she seemed to get better. Like she, she would get worse, and then they'd take her off the pills, and they, they'd just let her die. Yeah. Now she wound up getting, making a bit of a recovery, so then they put her on the pills again, and this continued until she actually died. I, I feel as though the, the medical industrial complex tortured my grandmother before she died. That's that's actually how I feel about that. Yeah, no, I understand. I understand. So I, I couldn't do something like that in good conscience. But me, I'm currently working on my doctorates in psychology. Okay, interesting. And I'm also working a full time job at McDonald's. Okay. Yeah. Terrible job, but I'm. I, I still need money. Of course. Listen, I really appreciate your call, and uh, I really hope you know. Besides uh, being a good psychologist, I'm sure you will succeed. At the same time, you know, you got great ideas, and whenever you find the place that you want to relocate and you're moving, start to think about it. We need young people getting involved in the political process because it's like, you know, if you want to change the machine, the machine is broken. So we got to become part of the machine. We got to ha- get our hands dirty. And only then, you know, even at just a local city council position, you could start to inject these ideas of freedom. And I really appreciate it. And please, Feel free to give me a ring anytime you want because I want your input. I like, you know, the idea that you guys, your generation is a, 
at least the generation soon after ours, that we're going to be standing, first of all, facing the consequences of all this act of, of, of uh, craziness, you know, from the debt, the bankrupt that we're going to face, and more important, the loss of rights. So you guys, uh, you know, with us, we, I mean, I'm still young myself, but we need to count on young people like yourself to continue this struggle. So I really appreciate you, and I thank you for following and to being active. I give you 30 seconds, everything you want to say before I need to go to the advertisement. Well, I don't really have anything to say other than we need to start talking to a lot more young people. But the problem is, is that it doesn't seem hip or cool or anything of that nature. You see a lot of the young people wanting to just, you know, screw around. So finding a way to convince the young people, that's the key. Perfect. I agree. Okay, guys, listen, I say again, if you want to be on this show, this is the show not just for the big guest names, you know, writers or authors or whatever. I want especially regular people with the great ideas or regular ideas, doesn't matter, and input and feedback and criticism is always welcome. Go to lovegansfreedom.com. There is my email. Shoot me an email, and I call you back. I promise, no filters. You can say whatever you want, and I really welcome you. Thank you. You're listening to Love, Guns, and Freedom. Don't go away. We got more news going on. Here we go, guys. Now, this is always the hour about love, and I like in this hour to meet my friends or people that I know or people that even I don't know, sharing their ideas, opinions about things. This is a friend, a friend that I met a long time ago when we were doing things in California about illegal immigration. He's a great guy, and uh, I need, him, I need his, uh, his uh, feedback because, you know, I'm from Italy, and uh, I would like to know somebody that is from the country where things are happening. And exactly, I'm talking about Cuba. I have, um, I would like to know exactly what is his opinion, since the man, he was born in Cuba, about this uh, Cuba-U.S. Uh, deal with uh, Obama. I will give you, of course, also my opinion, but more important, I would like to know what he thinks about it. His name is Frank George. Frank, are you there? I'm good, sir, and thank you so much for this opportunity, Luca. It's always good to have a few words with you and to exchange ideas, so thank proceed. Thank you. Before we go ahead, you know, I'm always so honored you invite me on your show, and I would like to please share the name of your show and how people can find you. Sure. It's, it's uh, an Internet-based radio show. It's Frank and Friends Internet Radio Show dot com. And we broadcast once a week, generally on Thursdays. Okay. And it is uh, a recorded thing, but uh, it's pretty fair. Yeah, no, it's great. I was your guest several times, and I really enjoyed the conversation. Listen, uh, very simply, what do you think about, as a man who was born in Cuba, and uh, maybe you still have relatives, I don't know if you still have relatives, but anyway, your roots are from there. What do you think about this Obama deal to reopen the relationship uh, relationships with uh, Cuba? Well, you know, uh, Luca, I wrestled with that decision. I had to think about it quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, the conclusion that I reached is that it's a terrible idea. It really is a bad idea. I don't think there's anything good in it for primarily the people of the United States. And, and I'd like to explain that. Of course, a lot of people point out that we do business with uh, communist China. We mm -hmm. do different things with the um, the Russian people. And uh, we have ties with many communist countries. But when it comes to Cuba, this is a different situation. To begin with, Cuba is a country with a population of 11 million. It's uh, about 90 miles um away from American territory, mm -hmm. and and uh, as people uh, reflect upon what our relationship with Cuba was prior to Castro, it was good, but unfortunately when Castro came into power, and Castro came into power because he was overthrowing an unpopular dictator, yes, uh, uh, things changed dramatically. We almost had a nuclear exchange with the Soviet Union. Uh, the Soviet Union had put nuclear missiles uh, on the island of Cuba after the um, failed Bay of Pigs attempt to overthrow Fidel Castro. Mm -hmm. And we have also fought proxy wars um, uh, in Angola. Cuban troops have uh, square or had squared off against American troops out there. Yes, yes. And these are things that a lot of the people don't know. There have been tremendous intelligence operations run from Cuba by what's called the DGI. That is the equivalent of the American CIA against uh, uh, America and Americans. There's drug running. 
that's done by the Cuban government itself. And all of this, of course, is because the, the character of the person that has subjugated the people of Cuba, that would be Fidel Castro and his brother Raul, Raul now runs that government. Mm-hmm. These people are nothing more than absolute criminals. There's nothing to trust there. So that's one of the issues. The other issue is our own president, Barack Obama, mm-hmm. who I, I believe is, is a Marxist and many other things. This is a man who is not to be trusted. So as I factor it, I look at this, and Barack Obama makes it possible for full relationships, uh, full travel back and forth uh, between the United States and uh, Cuba. It's going to help Cuba out uh, economically more than it will the United States of America. Uh, one of the possibilities that a lot of the uh, probable folks who will be coming from Cuba, perhaps even in a refugee status, because mm-hmm. Barack Obama is very big on that, yeah. Might be nothing more than subversives. So my, it, it would be different for me if we had a different president. I would probably say, yeah, it's it's a fair idea. But with the president who we have, who seems to hate this country and who has done so much against it, I would say that this is a horrible idea, one that should not be allowed to take place. Too late, I guess. Yeah, you know, I agree with you. You know, uh, because at the end of the day, if you think about it, if we are doing business with China. And of course, they owe most our debt. And we gave billions of dollars to North Korea. I mean, one of the most uh, terrible dictatorship there. Yeah. And other countries like that. And don't get me wrong, Russia, I think, sounds more freedom than ever right now. I mean, at least yes. the guy is taking care of his own people, okay? Maybe not perfect, Mr. X, former KGB Putin. But I tell you, I would change a change. I never thought to come to America and to cheer you up for a Russian president compared to Obama. It's, it looks like a Mr. Freedom, you know, compared to Obama. Mr. Putin, you know, I, I agree. I, know, I agree with all of your thoughts on that. You know, Putin seems like a more honorable human being yeah, than, than Barack Obama. He takes care of his people. He's against, you know, Monsanto and other stuff. I mean, he understands the global government. I mean, this, come on. But the point is now you're right. You know, unfortunately, everything Obama does, it sounds more to me like he's a Manchurian candidate. So yes. I don't trust anything he's doing, especially when we have somebody so close, as you said, just like... Uh, you know, 80 miles or so, I mean, you can almost swim it, okay? And uh, to have, a, 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 like, a gate, a gate that could be, uh, Cuba could be just the proxy, but could be behind Russia, could be behind China. We need a country that uh, we can have an opening much more. And more important, I always think about what if uh, I had a father or a mother who is rotting right now, specifically, you know, like uh, in one of these uh, Cuban jails, just mm-hmm. because they are political dissidents. You know, I mean, how can I go out and think, okay, now we have uh, this country uh, opening the arms to, to uh, normal relationship, but they don't want to address anything about all these poor bastards that they are dying and they are suffering just because they had different opinions about the Castro regime. You know, that's the bottom line. So, and the president is supposed to, in my opinion, President, Mr. Obama, at least he should uh, try to address that and try to work towards this direction. Because if there is an opening, they say, you know what, not only we want to try to get better neighbors, but also uh, we want to try to think about it's time to stop this tyranny like people going rotting in jail forever but at the same time i say also but who is obama to say that the man that was behind the national defense authorization act that is is worse and what cuba or any other dictator can do they can throw you in jail in jail and definitely the government can throw you in jail definitely just because suspected you to be a terrorist so there is no way obama is going to address any of this because at this point this administration like also with bush in the Patriot Act, we had almost at the same level of some of these act of tyranny. But I really I think uh, I agree with you on this one. Listen, uh, I want to ask you one more thing before we go ahead. You know, uh, what do you think about right now the situation of uh, these? Uh, now they started with ten thousand. Now they say about a hundred thousand refugees supposedly from Syria. I mean, they could be at this point any Muslim country. Uh, what's going on in Wyoming? Do you have any type of? Uh, uh, airplanes coming already? I mean, there is any type of allocation of numbers for your state? Uh, there are absolutely no allocations for our state at this moment in time. Wyoming is um, a state that does not have a formal refugee resettlement program wow. actually set up and running. It does exist on paper because our governor, Matt Mead, mm-hmm. in 2013 contacted the federal government and said that 
the uh, people of Wyoming had elected to pursue oh. a partnership of that sort. Well, he had never spoken to the people of Wyoming. <laughs> so uh, this was done without the knowledge of the legislators or the citizens. He just did it by himself. Wow. He, he was called out on it. I was very instrumental in revealing that he had done this. Hmm. Um, and, and as we look at it now, it seems like nobody's coming to Wyoming, but we're bracing ourselves, Luca, because yeah. this would be the perfect moment. Uh, Barack Obama wants to bring in more refugees because it suits his agenda. Yeah. And uh, Wyoming is the only state out of 49 states that does not have a a formal program that is functioning, but we do have the elements to make it go in a split second. So yeah. if Barack Obama picks up the phone and tells our governor, hey, put that refugee resettlement program into action, yeah. uh, we may uh, be screwed over. I understand. At least I pray for you. I pray for everybody in every state to try to do their part and have it good because it's going to be a terrible time in front of us. Listen, Frank, I really appreciate it. One more time, the website before I let you go. Your website. Frank and Friends, Internet Radio Show dot com. Thank you for the opportunity, Luke. I always enjoy spending time with you, my friend. Take care. Thank you. And now, guys, don't go away because we got more, more, uh, something very like a surprise. Let's put it in this way. Before I want to dedicate a song to Frank and to every man or woman who came or is in Cuba right now and believes in freedom and won't overthrow that bastards in power. And uh, this song is for, you know, for me to you guys. Cuba Libre. And forgive my Spanish. Cuba Libre. Tierra nuestra. De libertad. Cuba. Cuba Libre. Tierra nuestra. stand against the tyrant we're gonna fight this red revolution oppression and execution
A poet, a rifleman, I'm not afraid. and a constitutional activist. I'm not afraid. Italian by birth, I'm not afraid. American by choice, Jean-Luc Gazzana. I'm not afraid. And his new CD, Love, Guns, and Freedom. 16 powerful songs on one CD from the heart of a patriot. For download or to order the CD, go to www.lovegunsfreedom.com. That's www.lovegunsfreedom.com. Lyrics for your mind, music for your heart. John Lucasana's new CD, Love, Guns, and Freedom. <laughs> okay, guys, this is Luca Zane. You're listening to Love, Guns, and Freedom on KTOX 1340 AM and on United States of the FM Network. Well, I'm here right now exactly in front of the Mojave County Sheriff's Office in Mojave County, Kingman. Uh, I'm here with a special guest, and this is a emergency broadcasting. I'm not using this term lightly because I tell you, this is a very serious matter. It's about freedom or complete slavery. And uh, as I said many times, you know, we don't need to wait for the United Nations troops coming on our soil. We don't need to wait for Chinese troops or any type of other invaders. We already are under tyranny. And when I'll show you exactly what means tyranny, mean, tyranny means uh, completely living without law. It is no more the, the law of the land. This is no more about under constitutional bill of rights, but about some arbitrary power of an elected uh, uh, bureaucrat that they think they can write laws just because they have a pen and some piece of paper. Now, what we're going to face right now in Moave County is exactly the same situation many other people, many other uh, business owners and also Americans are facing in different parts of these United States. Right now we have it with me, I have the honor. I don't know this man in person, but I've been following exactly what he's been doing on YouTube in his part of this Moave County, standing up for his private business, standing up for his property, property, standing up for his family and his tradition and also his heritage of a rancher, okay? His name is uh, uh, Lavoy Panicum. Here we go. Well, thanks, uh, um, Luca. I really appreciate you having me on. And, and we're actually standing here in front of the Mojave County Sheriff Department. And, and so I, I want everybody to know that, that, um, I'm here and I just met with the Mojave County Sheriff. And I want people to know that, uh, I recognize, um, government and I recognize Mojave County as the, the legal law enforcement. And so I, I'm not an anarchist and, I, and I'm not against government. I, I'm just asking for the proper role of government. And so I had a, a wonderful meeting with him wherein, uh, he, he talked about, uh, you know, trying to, to stay neutral, making sure that things didn't turn out violent between uh, me and, and the federal government. And so I, let's ask you before we go, before, you know, I've been following you on YouTube, but I would like to give the short story exactly what happened to you the last few months, uh, this sort of uh, exchange between you and the BLM, okay? Yes. Um, well, what it is, is is I've gone ahead and acknowledged the uh, the county as the proper place for me to pay my taxes to. Instead of paying a grazing fee to the federal government, it should go to the Mojave County. And so I've canceled my, my, uh, my grazing with the federal government and I'm, I'm acknowledging Mojave County as the proper place to, to do that. Now, w the reason why this is important, you need to understand, is that the federal government controls one third of our land mass. And in this control, they've taken it to court and they say we have complete legislative power whatsoever over one third of the land mass of America and over 90% of Mojave County. And I'm saying that's not American. I, I don't elect these people. Um, they're not accountable to us. They're not under the power of recall. And to explain is that a bureaucrat behind a desk can write a statute. Okay. And that statute has the force and effect of law. And then that, that statute or that law is implemented and enforced by agents, armed agents, um, that are empowered with lethal means if necessary to enforce that. And if you get contrary to that law or that statute, you're hauled into a federal court. So all three branches of power are combined into one head with no representation. And that's not American. And I believe it's, it's, um, repugnant to the spirit of the Constitution and to the letter of the Constitution. 
Now, question. I know you specifically you have a few hundred cows. I mean, how many heads do you have? Well, I'm, a, I'm a small rancher. I've only got probably about a hundred head under brand right now. And so okay, so you got your cows. That's your job. That's your life. And what exactly is the problem? First of all, the government, uh, did, did you pay so far all this year? Have you been paying this mafia fee, as I call it? Right. Yeah, and, and people need to understand is that, that um, unlike Clive and where they were trying to force him off, I've had nothing but good relationships with the BLM. I've never been delinquent in payments. I've never been overgrazing. I've never had a trespass fee. And the people I work with are, are good people. I, I like them. But the principle is, do you own and control this land with complete authority? And they say, yes, these are grazing permits. They're not rights. And we're permitting you to use them. And I'm saying, no, this is a personal property right. This forage right, this grass, yeah, I, I don't own the mineral rights. I don't own the hunting rights. I don't own the rights of access. That belongs to the public. But the grass, the grass is mine. I bought it, not from them, but from an individual person who had it before me. You know what really sounds to me, and I come from Europe, that really we never really had rights. We always been between under the Roman emperors. We going back to the lords and kings, and you know, and the popes. This is exactly the same things under when you were under the king in the Middle Ages. That if you want to go there and uh, walk on the on the road, that's the king's road. King's road. If you want king's to go, road. yeah. If you want to get uh, hunting, you know, you don't have a right to survive or to thrive or to feed your family. That's a, a privilege that the king is going to give you. Things not really change so much, and this is. Super to be America. And what I find most disgusting for me that these people, as much as they can be nice, I'm sure they're human beings, they got families and they live in our community. Guess what? Even the Gestapo used to work under Hitler. They were family men, some of them. And there is no excuse, guys. If you are working now for the BLM, and this is Luca Zana speaking, not my friend here, you should start to look for another job, in my opinion, because I wouldn't serve evil like that. But let's go back to business. Now, exactly when all the problems started. I know you have some problem with the water. That that, uh, according to what you said, you have uh, some some sort of a... Uh, let's go. I need, I need to be careful in this, and, and I'm glad you brought it up so I can clarify a little bit of it. Yes. I had an inside tip that I need to be careful of my waters. Um, I went out there. Two of my drinkers, two, or two of my trick tanks, they were plugged off. And so so I'm, I'm laying at the, the BLM's feet, but I have no evidence. And so when you accuse people without evidence, you, you need to be careful. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, it took me it took me about a week to get those, those tanks running again, but I did get them running. And so, so that is good. And and you know, and, and again, I I um I I recognize I recognize Mojave County as as the uh, as a the appropriate form of government. I recognize um Jim um McCabe as as the you know the duly elected law enforcement. It wasn't elected; it was appointed. But that's fine. For now, this is our sheriff, and we stuck with that. That's fine. Now, question is exactly uh, because you are out of the blue. Well, finally, I would say you say you know what? Yep. Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't want to pay anymore, you guys. So, so in other words, I'm saying I need to be consistent with the principles. If I honestly believe that these are grazing rights and not permits, and that this land should be administered by the county and the state, and that the Tenth Amendment should be upheld, mm -hmm. if I continue to pay my grazing fees to the federal government, I empower what I consider an illegal and illegitimate entity. And so, to be consistent, I had to say, I, I wrote a letter to the Solicitor General, and they sent it back to the Mojave County Sheriff, um, saying that I appreciate, you know, you helping me manage my ranch, but I will no longer need your service. I am hereby canceling all contracts with the, uh, with the federal government. And so now, I said, that's where I'm at. Now, they've actually already contacted the sheriff. They've contacted um, um, other um, state agencies. They, they've actually, I just finished the, the interview or the, the meeting with Jim McCabe, and they asked to be deputized. <laughs> they asked for the, the, there's the FBI and the head of BLM law enforcement. They asked for the, the sheriff to deputize them. And I really appreciate Jim McCabe saying, no, I'm not going to do that. Wow, that's great. Yeah. That I'm, I'm glad to hear that. You know, I always want to give everybody the opportunity to prove themselves, you know, and that's a great start because the fact that the agencies, the federal agency, ask to uh, a sheriff, they know that... Uh, they don't have that authority unless we give it to them. Yes. And I'm sure you're familiar with Sheriff Mack, especially the Supreme Court case, Mack uh, Prince against the United States. You know that? A little bit, yeah. He's always been in, in struggles with the, the federal government. Yeah, but more important, you know, he's been a struggle. Sheriff Mack, also, you won a very milestone uh, battle against the federal tyranny mm -hmm. and reminded to the federal government that they have no jurisdiction in our counties. No jurisdiction. Unless there are three specific exceptions that we won't go here. But this is for sure. It's not about cows 
also grazing rights, okay? Not, not cows, so, grazing rights. so that's the point, the share of as that power. And we must, at this point, as as people, we the people, we citizens, Thomas Jefferson said something, okay? Correct me if I paraphrase it. After all, I'm from Italy. Okay. But, but after all, what he said, we will get the tyranny that we will allow it. Okay? So now, think about it. Think what happened at the Bundys. Few hundred of us, American people, say, you know what? You tell us that we are slaves just because you say so. You tell us to jump just when you say so. We are not jumping and we are not your slave. And, and we are standing up as a free human beings here together, uh, standing close. Even I don't know you. I, don't, I didn't know the bandits and many other people. We don't even eat cows. It's not about the cows. It's not about any specific group. It's about freedom and due process and our constitution. So this is the time. All of you guys and girls, men, women, child, children, and everything, everybody can understand this show. It's time that we decide how much tyranny we're going to let happen. Before the struggle was in Nevada, up there in Mesquite or wherever it is, now it's going to be probably in Moave County. What are you, what you facing exactly? You got a nasty letter yeah, from them? This, this is what, well, they, they're, they're following procedures. Um, now that I said that I'm not going to um, pay the grazing fee and I turned out, then they, they now send me a letter saying, you're in, you're in violation, you're in trespass, and, mm -hmm. and for about every 10 days, it's about a, a, about $1,500 that my fees wow. rack up. And so by the end of the year, I could be looking at about $50,000. Um, not even the mafia gets this interest, by the way. They got a little more lenience. Yeah, um, and so, so I, I, and I informed um, Sheriff McCabe that I have no intention of leaving. Uh, no intention. And I also told him that I, I'm not going to pick up a gun and, and, and be the first one to, to point it at somebody or shoot at any, anybody. And so, don't worry about that. They do that always. Yeah, they yeah. point the gun first. Yeah, so far, we know their mother's super And they like also to shoot normally a mother holding their child. Okay? I wasn't in the country, but I read history. And look what happened in different parts of the country, like in Idaho in the 90s. Okay? Unfortunately, yeah. this is happening. And I hope, you know, these people working for the BLM or the federal agency understand that not because they tell you that that's an order, you must follow that order. You have a bill of rights. You have a Constitution, more important, you took an oath. Some of you, many of you, all of you should have taken an oath to uphold that Constitution. So if your superior Gestapo tells you go there and knock him down or arrest that person just because you say so, think about it. Are you going to follow the order just because somebody tells you, or are you going to stand with the people and with America and the foundation of this country? And I can just ask the American people, do, do this thing. Get a map of the United States and, and pull up and say, um, public lands, lands held by the, the Bureau of Land Management or the federal government. And you'll see back east that it's very little. But as it gets out west here, the federal government had a duty to dispose of these lands to the states. And as they got out here further and further west, they got slower and slower at disposing the lands to the states until they finally says, no, it's ours, we're holding it. And they'll say, well, we're holding it for the people. But that's they have no constitutional right to hold that land. They can only hold lands for the defense of the nation. The Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17. Forts, docks, arsenal, and other needful buildings. And so, in other words, the federal government has the right to own land for the defense of its nation. But they don't have the right to own and control, you know, 90 plus percent of Mojave County, you know, 98 percent of Nevada. And we don't we don't elect these federal bureaucrats. They're not accountable to us. That's anti-American. Exactly. No, there's even worse. Even if the Congress, you know, wanted to do something like, you know, decide which land we can use or not, that would be bad enough. But now the point is that there are some just low level uh, bureaucrats, you know, some local BLM office, just because they can have some ink and paper and start to put in the federal registry whatever they think is right. right. Like, for example, I, I remember that in uh, Nevada just a few months ago, they said they're about Three million acres, they're supposed to be off limits for the people. So that means only them and the semi gods and whoever wants to be there according to their people. I mean, it's no more. Look, it's happening already now. They're closing down in Moave County different trails. They're closing yeah. down in different states like in Oregon trails. That, that should be up to the county commissioners, the county supervisors, to th that government closest to the people governs best. And those people are elected. You can, I can pick up a phone and I can reach my Mojave County supervisor. I can reach my sheriff. You think I'm going to reach Barack Obama? You think I'm going to reach um, John McCain? That, that's insane yeah. to think that they're going to hear me 
or, or have any concern about I'm it. sure you're familiar with the magic word, Agenda 21, that uh, it is nothing new, it is not a conspiracy. A few years ago, of course, people used to laugh at us. It, it's uh, My listeners understand. If you don't understand, guys, just Google it, okay? This is now mainstream. And bottom line is very simple. Agenda 21 is the United Nations plan to declare all the rest of humanity a bunch of serfs because they will control the resources. They will control the land. They will control the water. They will control our food production. They will tell us where we live and when we live and how we live and if we can live at all. So that's the reality. Now it's happening. This is happening right now in Moave County. They don't want people like you, first of all, being still out there, living like some sort of a semi-free life, okay? Yeah, and uh, one, number yeah. one. And number two, more important, you produce food. And yeah. that's not good because we're supposed to eat. It serves only what they gave us. And more important now, it's the mindset. If you tell, if they can prove that they're gods, Okay? And we must kneel every time they walk in front of us. If they tell us, by the way, this land is mine, just because I say so. So every time you walk over, you got to pay. You yeah. pay once, you pay twice, yeah, it's becoming God that you are a slave. See, 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 Luca, you, you need to understand is that the holding to the federal government control increases each year. Okay, for example, the ranch just next to me, it used to be owned by, by a ranching family. An environmental group came in here called the Grand Canyon Trust, and they, they purchased it. And then they turned around and gave it to the federal government. Government. So now the federal government's there holding both the grazing right and claiming the land itself. And that's not the only one. Down further on the strip, there's other ranches that they've bought and they're holding it, no cattle upon it. And so every year they increase their control and ownership over the land. And, and, and you know, it's very soft. It's, it seems to be very benign and it doesn't affect most of the people in the United States right now. But indeed, if you can control the land, you control the food production, you can control the people. And so we need to get back to the Constitution in its original intent, and that is a limited government. Federal government is dealing with those things that protect our, our border and protect our nation. Perfect. And, you know, guys, now this is my message for all the listeners, people that they may agree, especially people that do not agree, or maybe people that they are normally lazy and say, you know what, after all, I don't even eat meat. I uh, eat vegetarian or whatever. I don't live in the country. Who cares? Guys, it is not about uh, meat. This is not about anything like personal. This is about the freedoms that belong to all of us. And uh, this could end in a very powerful and peaceful way. Of course, we now speaking in. This could end in a very powerful peaceful way. If at least, so let's say we had 200,000 people in Mobile County, okay, uh, approximately. Okay. Even just uh, 1% of us say, you know what? I don't know this guy that is talking about cows and uh, grazing rights. I don't even care about him. But guess what? He is my brother in freedom. And I will go there and stand up in front of him, not even in front, side with him, peacefully, to say, you know what? You federal scumbags, go back to Washington because that's all the place you belong. And this is me speaking, by the way. Uh, you're not saying scumbags. This is Luca Zana. Be sure that nothing else. I tell you, you are a bunch of scumbags and you are leeches, parasites. Because really, all you do, you don't help us in anything. All you do, you create more drama in our lives. We were doing fine before you come in, in trespass in our counties, before you trespass in our states. We were doing fine with the, uh, with the ecology. We were doing fine with the nature. We were doing fine with the economy we were doing fine you came here you destroyed the ecology you destroyed the nature you destroy our resources and you put us out of business so my personal mission to message to all the BLM people if you are nice change job if you are corrupted go to hell that's look at Zanato pretty, pretty strong words there no, no, this is me as I say you know I, I agree I agree you're, I could be put in jail in Italy if I say this stuff that's why I'm here okay I still have freedom of speech so go to hell let, let, let's let's deal with some specifics here yes there's not even have to do with the cows or the grass. Yes. But the richest uranium in the, all the world is right out there on the Arizona Strip. As a young man, I, I worked on those wildcat rigs, mm -hmm. and that and that ore is recoverable in a very um, ecologically, um, very environmentally um, um, sensitive way. You, it's, it's subterranean, it's small, and once they recover and they, they reclaim the land, you can't even tell the mines there. There are billions and billions of dollars sitting there that somebody just wrote on, um, you know, the, the, the Department of Interior says, no more mining. 
We didn't vote on that. We didn't accept that. If the mining was opened up there on the Arizona Strip, you would have tax revenue flowing into um, the city of Kingman. You'd have jobs. You'd have people out there feeling good about themselves because they, they, they're, they're busting their butt, earning a living, working on in the mines, working on the wildcat rigs. If I can say something, you know, I don't know. This is just a conspiracy. But the point is, I maybe believe that maybe that's exactly why they don't want you there. Because at the end of the day, so far, we have proofs like McCain and Flake, you know, giving also uh, uh, Holy Land or whatever it's called, uh, special land, you know, heritage land from the Apache or other tribes out there. They give it to foreign corporations. Like we know very well that the, the Bundys, there was behind the document that there was proven that a big part of their land where the Bundys, they were operating, uh, they were pretty much given as a deal to a Chinese corporation to try to do some solar farm for a steel. So I don't know the whole story, but I tell you, normally when they want to send somebody out of this property because you are almost like you are nuisances, you know, you're there with your family, your horses or whatever, your ranch, you are paying the butt. There's great wealth out on that, that Arizona Strip. Exactly. And I think that, that, that we don't know all the story, but regardless, people have the right to use the public land and we have not supposed to be living as, as, as in fear and always paying this mafia fee. You know, in Italy there is called, uh, if you have a business, you pay taxes first, of course, you know, whatever you need to pay, a lot of money. And then yet every week you got a man come there and ask you for the not official tax to the mob. You know, I tell you, I don't know what is worse, uh, the mob or the federal government. At this point, at least, you know, the mob, you can shoot back. That's yeah. a little more fair, because yeah. at least you can defend yourself. With the federal government, you can win very much. So, and one thing, one point I do want to make is that that I'm, I'm, I'm not a freeloader. I'm, I'm not taking something that's not mine. And I do believe in supporting the proper role of government. And so, in lieu of my, my grazing fees that I no longer will pay, mm -hmm. I'm going to pay a 2.5 percent off my gross of cattle protections, a production tax to Mojave County. Mm -hmm. So I want to support Mojave County. I want to support this government. Did, that is closest did you me. speak with the county supervisors? I, I did. In fact, um, I, they actually called me back and they're going to travel all the way up uh, 300 miles up to uh, uh, the, the substation up there to visit with me. Um, um, Gary Watson, uh, the head of the fishing game and the brand inspector. Um, I'm not sure I'm not sure uh, they're most Motives, I'm not sure because I have talked to Gary Watson and says, please put in uh, uh, the mechanisms to receive my, my production tax. And he says, well, I have to, I have to talk to the Bill M first. I says, well, why do you have to talk to the Bill M to receive a county tax? As well. So, so anyway, he, they, they've, they've contacted me. They're going to meet with me this Friday. Um, and I'll, I'll explain the same things. I hope it goes well. And I, I appreciate them coming to visit with me. Okay, listen now for the every uh, everybody out there, uh, if they want to help you, even just understanding better the struggle that you're facing. Because this is a struggle for you, your family. You're not going to have a picnic, okay? It's going to be you could just pay the the money and be oh, happy. Yeah, I, I, could, and, and, I could be living fine. If, yeah. uh, see, I, I wasn't being oppressed. The 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 the, the fees they're asking me were not onerous, yeah. uh, you know. And and so I'm making the stand on principle. But let me tell you, they they they'll come at me. Um, um, through uh, financial means, or their their turn their their stated goal was to do this administratively first mm -hmm. before it goes to any physical type thing. So so yeah, I'm I'm going to have a, a fight on my hands. But as long as I can can remain standing, there's no way that I'm going to going to leave. I'm not going to let them take my cows. Okay, that's why I'm here, guys. This is not about being greedy or getting an extra dollar for yourself. This guy could have just said, you know what, whatever, I'll pay you like I've been paying all these years. Oh, been cheap. And, and everything's fine, it's cheap. Now, uh, dealing with the devil is kind of dangerous, okay? And we must at least respect a man who's standing for the principles, regardless if you agree with him or not. That's my personal opinion. Right. Now, what I would like to ask you is this. Uh, do you have a website or a place where people can follow uh, pretty much in real time what's going on with you? I, I do. I went ahead and created a website called um, One Cowboy Stand for Freedom. It's, it's a website where I post uh, any YouTube videos I make. I, I try to put out a monthly newsletter. And um, and also to, to finance uh, this, um, I, I've written a book that was uh, that's just been published. I wrote it actually two years ago. And it's called... Um, um, only by blood and suffering, regaining lost freedom. And that's a way that if people want to help support, they can, they can purchase the book. It's, it's on Amazon. It's doing really good. Five stars. Wow. Uh, yeah, people have been very generous and, I, and I'm really grateful for that. But it's on, it's on Kindle. It's on Amazon. And it teaches the principles of the, the natural rights of man versus the collective in a, in a, 
novel form. It's about a family trying to come together in a time of national crisis. So say again, please, the name of the website. Uh, Lavoy Finney, or it's, it's One Cowboy Stand for Freedom. Dot com, I guess, right? Yeah, dot com, I believe. Perfect, yeah. Okay, guys, this is pretty much the message right now. You heard it. It's happening in Moave County, Arizona. Well, probably next time, or maybe at the same time, it's happening in some other county somewhere in the United States of America. It's happening everywhere. And it's going to get worse and worse. This is like a pack of coyotes, you know. They come at night, and they see if they can get away with a couple of chickens. When they see that the chickens, they're good, and the, the person is not watching uh, the chickens, guess what? Next time they're going to come, and they're going to eat all to your children. So be careful. One, one last thing. Um, um, I I would like to mention is that first it was just a, a single rancher in Nevada standing up mm -hmm. and that was Clive and Bundy. Now I'm standing in Arizona and now there are ranchers in Utah standing making the same stand and so you have the witness of three separate ranchers, three separate states saying the same thing. So it's not just one person making the stand. And that's why they're afraid because it's like a virus. It's a good virus. It's called freedom. It's called standing up for our rights. It's called making our founding fathers proud. After all, we've been sleeping too long. It's time to stand up. You've been listening to Love, Guns, and Freedom with Luca Zanna, and I really appreciate it. If you move your ass, you do something, start to make a phone call to this BLM. After all, they are not gods. Their phone that they have in their chair where they put their fat asses, it's our chairs we pay for it and i'm saying this words nobody else here so tell him politely but stern say you know what stop acting like god okay if you want to really be a boss you go to your wife and boss your wife around that's my humble message from look at zan and don't go away because we got more news going on and don't forget if you want to support the show since i'm not corporate sponsor you can go to my website zanna.us www.zanna.us and i'm very familiar the homeland security you go there every week i see you you never buy any of my music busters but you can buy any of my songs for 99 cents zana.us ciao here we go guys uh back into the studio i apologize for the poor quality of the audio there was a lot of wind i tried to mitigate it but it was kind of rough today show it's almost over it was a uh, it's always like kind of a, a work you know it's like uh i don't know, like a creation uh i'm not trying to fill uh, three hours full of fluffy i try to bring you news i try to look for guests i try more important to look for ideas and solutions i try to inspire each other so we need to really to, to 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 do it and i need your help i'm a human being i'm a person i'm just a regular guy with a lot of limitations i have an accent my grammar sucks i'm trying to learn and honestly i appreciate the show because it's giving me the opportunity to improve my english besides Something normally I don't say so much, but I really do. I want to remind you also about freedomlovers.us. You know, we need to take a break once in a while. We don't want to just always work and fight. We need also to regroup, find like-minded people, friends, and also maybe who knows, the special person. Uh, freedomlovers.us, www.freedomlovers.us. It's a free, completely free, 100% free a dating and networking site for like-minded people who believe in freedom. I created this place, uh, and the beautiful thing is, uh, you know, it is not just for singles. Also, if you have a family, if you are a husband or committed, you can find friends and also find like-minded people to network and prepare. This is about this. Now, a few more days, a few more, another week, I guess, before the Chris Chang uh, contest to win a free Life Diamond membership at Front Sight. It's almost over. So go to lovegunsfreedom.com and you can be the lucky person to win over $15,000 value lifetime membership at Front Sight sponsored by myself. I always, always like to remind you, you know, I'm here because uh, you support me also in a way, not just uh, send me the, the donation that I don't accept donation, no, buy my music, I appreciate it, that really helps. But also your emails, your support, your ideas, your input, because otherwise, you know, for me it would make no sense, seriously. I have so many things to do, and I see more and more I... I'm getting more people that they interact with this show and more listeners. And I appreciate your help for every one of you who share this show on social media or any way you can. You know, YouTube, I do appreciate it. If you have any type of ideas, input, or anything you want to say, I welcome you here. Uh, Lovegunsfreedom.com. Uh, you can find my email. And at this point, all I can say, guys, I need to go ahead for the kitchen. I'm hungry. Today I want to talk to you about a recipe, but, you know, we didn't have time. I will talk to you about next week. It's a great recipe of pasta. Back to that. And the orecchiette with the endive. Is that right? I don't know. But anyway, it's really good. Spicy and excellent. And also, you know, looking forward to have this week in front of us. Hopefully we can have some good news. And I'm glad that so far in September, even we predicted a lot of uh, potential um, 
interesting things about the economy that could be devastating. Even things that are not perfect, they are not great. I'm glad that things are not still precipitating completely. I hope to be always wrong in everything when it comes down to bad news. You've been listening to Love, Guns and Freedom with Lucas Zanna. Thank you very much and God's willing, I will talk to you next time.